Are we live? We are live. Welcome everyone to the City Council regular meeting. Tuesday, June 6, 2023. And our pledge tonight is led by someone we've not seen before. Gabe Segal. Gabe, come on down. Pacific Elementary School. Gabe, come on down here. I went to Pacific. Everybody do it. So tell them where to stand up, where to, where to turn towards the flag and all that. So turn towards the flag, um, put your right hand over the heart of your heart, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well done. Oh, you can't go anywhere yet. So, Principal Rhonda Steinberg, most of you know that she's going to retire after how many years, Rhonda? 18 years? 18 years in this district. 18 years in this district. She's going to come over, and Christy Ross, her principal, is going to talk about, I mean her principal, her teacher's going to talk about Gabe. Started when she was 12. That's, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? Politician. Christy? <laughs> Let's get out of your way first. <laughs> So when the fifth grade team at Pacific was asked to honor someone for their achievements in community service, I knew Gabe would be perfect for this award. Gabe is one of the most charismatic and outgoing students I have had the pleasure of teaching in my 17 years in education. He exudes school spirit, positivity, and has lots of enthusiasm. These qualities, paired with his quick wit and great sense of humor, give him a natural ability to connect with people of all ages and backgrounds and make people smile. Gabe's family shared with me that he has been involved in community service since he was a toddler. The Siegel family was very involved for many years with an organization called The Giving Spirit. They would pack and distribute survival kits and duffel bags to the homeless population across Los Angeles. And because of Gabe's close interactions, speaking and connecting with the homeless throughout his childhood, he quickly understood how a hello, how are you doing, could brighten someone's day, especially someone who's feeling down and out. Gabe's mom shared how this connection made their plight very real to him and helped him learn the lesson early on that helping others was a duty we all have, and it's something that he has made a part of his life. Okay. <laughs> um, Gabe has also been involved in community service through his Boy Scouts troop. Gabe has been a member of Boy Scouts from the time he was in second grade and has been involved in beach cleanups, raising money for children to go to summer camp, collecting fruit and clothes for the less fortunate, and learning important life lessons about how to be a constructive member of society. Um, when I first met Gabe, it took me only just a few days to recognize that Gabe loves a good challenge. He loves to use his creativity and out-of-the-box thinking to solve a problem, which is why it only makes sense that he is on the Odyssey of the Mind. He has, he's part of an amazing and undefeated team at the national level, right? And they have won two years, um, consecutive years, at the world level. Um, and just two weeks ago, they competed in the world's competition in Michigan. And they came fourth out of 64 teams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not only does Gabe excel when he is part of a team, but he's also a great leader. He's very thoughtful and inclusive and making sure everyone's voice is heard. Gabe, um, one of his greatest strengths is his compassion for people. I have witnessed firsthand Gabe stand up against bullying, give pep talks to peers feeling low, and help classmates get back on their feet after taking a tumble. Gabe has made it his mission to help others feel valued. And lastly, when I recently spoke with Gabe, he feels that one of his greatest achievements is his family. He is grateful for his family and enjoys spending time with them, especially his grandparents. Mom shared that they have been a big part of his upbringing and has a very special bond with them. Gabe also shared that he feels very lucky um, living in Manhattan Beach. He has grown up with a lot of wonderful experiences and opportunities that he believes everyone should be fortunate enough to experience for themselves. And so I think there's no doubt that this honor is well-deserved. Congratulations, Gabe. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. You want to go 
funny in principle, I'd probably hand that back uh, to back. Gabe is not shy. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe does exude spirit every day. I think everybody at our school knows the Siegel Boys in a good way. And um, we, we couldn't be prouder to have you represent our school as our uh, actually citizen of the year because we only do this once a year. So congratulations, Gabe. <laughs> I want to thank everybody so much, and I want to introduce my mom, Donna, my dad, James, my Zeta, um, Clive, and my grandma, who's not here today, but her, she's Lorraine, and then my grand, who's Linda, and then my amazing twin, who I've been with for all my life, Noah, and I want to thank you so much to my teacher and my principal and the mayor and everybody on the board. <laughs> Hope all your home are watching this date. There's your future mayor, Congressman, Senator, right there. He started here. It's amazing. So Gabe, come over here in the middle. You're not seeing double. That is his twin. So I right over here. So I'm going to read this to you, and you can post it to everybody else. So the city of Manhattan Beach and the school district recognize you. Recognize that, Gabe? Pacific Elementary School for Outstanding Citizenship and Manhattan Beach Unified School District, dated 2022-2023. Congratulations. And the mayor pretends to give you a pin. That means now, you're special to the city. And now you have a pin because you're going to be a future mayor. Okay, That's right. So wear it proudly. I'll remember the day. And you're going to turn towards all those cameras to your right. Get used to that. <laughs> Wait, one more guy's coming in. We'll do a team photo here. Are everybody ready? Oh, look at this. All the you're ready. Thanks. Thank you. Yay. Well done. Yay. Congratulations, Yay. man. Come visit any time. Yeah. One official. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one more. Oh, one well, more. Well, more. Well, Practice photo. Really okay. Hold up again. Oh, turn turn towards the guy in the blue okay. shirt. Oh, oh. Okay. Jojo. Ready? One, two, three. Yay. All right, now it's real. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Pat. Congratulations. Thank you. Do I have to retire, too? Mayor Napolitano says it's all downhill except for our next uh, yeah. ceremony. Oh, we got one more? Oh, we got a couple. Okay. So most of you know that when the city has commissioners of service volunteers, we recognize them on their outgoing term. We have a lot of them tonight. So I'm going to ask them to all come down. Uh, Kathleen Perales, TPIC, Bruce Greenberg, Parks and Rec. Kimwander Parks and Rec, Ray Sirota, Parks and Rec, Betsy Rubino, Cultural Arts, and Roberta Schreiner, Library. Please come up and join us here. Joe, you got to help me here. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen Perales. Bruce Greenberg. I say school board member, Bruce Greenberg. Ken, where's Ken? Race Rotors, uh, stepping in. There you are. You are. Long time no see. How are you, buddy? Thank you. Thank Long you. time no see. see you. Elizabeth Slash, Betsy Rubino. Thank you. Thank you. And Roberta Schreiner, otherwise known as Ro. Yes, Ro. So I don't even know you as Roberta. It's confusing. So you can hang out with us. So. These people that serve us, some of them for how many years? I know years and years and years, as I say. And George Apostle, and Rhea Atman, and Emma Darrow, and Dick Ackerman, um, Jerry Morton, Margaret Napier. They're all volunteers. Some of them served for years and years. How many years, Kathleen, have you served on commissions? 18 years. 18 ago. years. Not away from a real life job, but think of the people that we have, the quality of people that we have as volunteers, commissioners. Imagine working for free. And you're on city for 18 years and go to all the meetings that we go to all of them so that's why i recognize each one independently because from 18 years down to race you serve what one year yeah. <laughs> that's all right hey it's a volunteer wcw so we want to thank you all for your time that's what we can't give back to you. your time is more important than anything. the amount we pay you it's a matter of time so we my council colleagues thank you for the privilege of your time 
So with that, ask them all to give them a round of applause for all of them serving our city. Can you, do a, can you get us all in one team photo, Jonah? Can you get us all together? Some of them drop, maybe. Drop down? You guys come down. We'll get so Ro and all Betsy, not you, raise your tall. So we're going to squeeze in there. I promise we won't do anything. Right. Can you get us in one photo? Yeah, Sorry, you yeah. need to move that chair right in the middle. Okay. It's the worst setup. Thank you. Okay. Well done. Voice serving. Awesome. One, two, three. Goodness. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Thank you all. Appreciate it. You're not going anywhere. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. One good things to do. Yeah. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Thanks, dude. Thank you. Bye, Rob. <laughs> I never even told about, Jim, how many years of service they all were together. I bet it's over 75 years of service that they've given to the city. It's amazing. That class of volunteers that we had. But we're not done. The presentation of accommodation to Seraptus International of Manhattan Beach for their 70 years of dedication to ongoing, I'm sorry, improving the lives of women and children so I know that we're going to call up Madeline Kaplan and someone else you want to bring with you, Madeline, right? Who's with you? Monica Frank. Monica, come up here. Maybe we're Tim Frank and you have to hand, hand him some pens. Yeah, you want to close that door, Jojo, please? Disruptive, please. I know. We're not going to read the whole proclamation because you'll be here for a while. <laughs> but I want to point out that my colleagues and I recognize Sraptus International Manhattan Beach belongs to a worldwide organization for business and professional women who work to improve the lives of women and girls and local communities throughout the world. So you want to give us a short comment past that? Uh, on behalf, uh, my name is Monica Fry. I am incoming president for 2023-2024 season and Madeline Kaplan is our incoming co-vice chair of uh, programs also coming in and a new member. Today is actually the 70th anniversary. We were chartered on June 6, 1953 so it was apropos that we, this came today so we're very honored and grateful for this commendation and uh, we continue our work to improve the lives of women and girls through our um, many educational programs and looking to build our membership continually. So any future Seroptimists in the audience, please reach out to us. Madeline, would you like to say a few words? Um, our signature program is the Live Your Dream Award, which is significant in that it gives educational grants money to single head of households who are female, um, who are parents. And it's the biggest gift I think you can give anyone, which is a leg up and an opportunity to succeed and care for their family. So um, when you see our fundraisers throughout the year, we invite you to join us in helping women overcome obstacles. Thank you. Well done. All right, I'll read the concluding line here and let them get on with the rest of their night here. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Richard Montgomery, Mayor of the City of Manhattan Beach, California, on behalf of the City Council, all of my colleagues here, and the residents of Manhattan Beach, to hereby commemorate the 7th anniversary of Swaptos International Manhattan Beach, dated this 6th day of June 2023. Congratulations. Thank you. Hang on. Uh, I think Mayor Patum Frank has got a couple pins for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I put my mayor as a work here. Right? No, one, no one could sit down this job. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. Very much. Joe's going to give you the pins and celebrate. I think we're going to see you again, man. I don't know why I have this feeling. So all my council colleagues join us for a picture. Thank you very much. And we're all going to look to see that man, the blue yeah. shirt up there on top of the oh, stairs. Wait, Jojo, okay, we're looking in this direction. So okay. there we go. Look at Jojo. Okay, Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I'm just guessing, I don't even know. Mine doesn't have a cushion, so. Okay. Your Honor? Yes, I haven't forgotten. I'm just going to organize for my next comment. Someone took my favorite sheet of paper. Where did it oh, go? Is it this one? Is this it? No. Uh, everybody, hold on. You've got a technical issue here on the mayor's part. I have my favorite pen. I have my favorite pad of paper. No. Is it in that stuff? No. 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 Well, Joe and I had it somewhere here. Is it underneath your binder? There's papers underneath. No, but I'll just go ahead anyway. This is so recognize the significance of today's date, June 6th. Most of you know if you're over the age of 30, you know I'm talking about. 79th anniversary of D-Day. Mm -hmm. so if you don't know what that is, you have to Google it. If you're too young, you know what I'm talking about. But those of us that know what it actually is, want to recognize them this time. Ask all of our veterans currently serving, anyone that has served uniform before, to please rise and be recognized. Any veterans here today? There's one. I appreciate that, sir. <laughs> Thank you for your service, and I'm glad that uh, you were here with us today, especially. With that, I will go to roll call. Councilmember Howarth? Here. Councilmember Lesser? Here. Councilmember Napolitano? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Franklin? Here. Mayor Montgomery? I'm here as well. We're going to move to item E, approval of agenda and waiver of full reading of ordinances. My coll council colleagues, if you want to talk or raise a push the button, if not, you know, first and a second. I have a first by Councilmember Howard and a second by Councilmember Lesser. Roll call, please. Motion passes 5 0. All right, thank you. Next item F City Council and Community Organization announcements of upcoming events. One minute per person. Who's got a community announcement for us? One minute, just come on down here and tell us who you are and who you represent. Good evening, Mayor and Member of the Council. My name is Ann Bose. I'm here on behalf of Manhattan Beach Library. Good evening. I, want to, I would like to invite members of the community to sign up for the online version of the Summer Discovery Program on our website, lacountylibrary.org. Join our Summer Discovery Program, a celebration of reading and exploration for all ages. Earn the chance to win prizes and help us reach our goal of 50,000 books this summer. I'm also honored to announce that the LA County Library was awarded the 2023 National Medal for Museum and Library Services by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. This is our nation's highest honor for the institution that makes significant and exceptional contributions to the community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank Tell you. Josh, congrats. You guys did a great job for all of us. Great. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Our next few announcements. Seeing none on Zoom, Martha. Colleagues, any announcements? Uh, well, Mr. Mayor, if I may, just on a personal note, yes. uh, I want to introduce two of my visitors here today, my family members, my sister, Elizabeth Nyland. Welcome, Elizabeth. Yeah. And next to her? And to her right, I don't know. She just keeps hanging around. But that's my wife, Nancy Frank. <laughs> <laughs> She's hung around for 33 years, so I'm very proud. God bless you, Nancy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I don't like that tone. <laughs> give her, give her a pin. Where's your city? Give her a pin. Can I have her come down? No. Um, no. I, I think, we, we, Joe, you're going to be on your best behavior tonight, I, Mayor. I, I, I got one at home I'll, I'll give to you. City pin? <laughs> city pin. All right. Okay. Well, welcome. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Uh, let's see. Our next item up. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We did public. This is council comments. Oh, I have a comment. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, I'm, I'm waiting for you to push your button, but go ahead. I know. I didn't. I'll try um, that by the time you're ready, Joe. Please. Okay. <laughs> Let's just walk that statement back. <laughs> All right. I'll get used to reminding you. All right. Fair enough. Um, I just want to report out to the community. I um, represent the council and the community on the uh, clean power 
uh, agency a joint use authority. And we recently approved some uh, increases uh, in the electricity rates. However, uh, we did that. I mean, it's cost more to procure electricity. Also, Edison increased their rates. And I wanted to let everybody know that um, all of our rates are going to be on par or less than Edison. So if you have chosen the least amount of clean power, that's the lean power, you will be saving a, a roughly $9.70 per month compared to an Edison bill. If you're at 50% renewable, you're going to save about $7.80 a month. And if you're getting 100% uh, renewable, you'll save about 50 cents a month. But it's still cheaper than Edison. So we are uh, doing some really good stewardship of our resources. We're creating a very strong financial electric procurement, electricity procurement organization. I'm really, really proud of that work and want you all to know that. Well done. Anyone else on council have announcements before I move forward? Anyone? Martha, please. There we go. So Coffee with the Mayor was held today, and I want to thank both Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf at the Village and Pete's Coffee here downtown. They've been nothing but gracious to hold a spot for me to have a table and take all comers. There's no staff there, just me. And um, it's never boring, and the questions you get asked, you're surprised that there's questions I can't answer. Um, but good questions nonetheless. Everyone's welcome. The next one is June 27th. Uh, was there time there at the bottom there, Martha? I can't see it on my screen. 3.30, uh, the next one is a coffee bean and tea leaf in Manhattan Village. So what else did you have past that for me? Any else announcements? Oh, yes, our baby passports. <laughs> for those of you who have not uh, been notified yet, or just reminders that we have the passports that are only unique to Manhattan Beach for any babies born in the city. And since we're stuck in that COVID catch-up time of 20 and more, if you have a baby born in 20 or 19, 20 till now, just let our city clerk Lisa Tamara, or just the city clerk, Martha Alvarez, no, email them and they'll set you up with the, yes, that's, is that your picture, Steve, there? I can't remember which picture that is that we use as an example. <laughs> but we have those passwords for you. It's still ongoing, and uh, I know there's a queue. I don't know what the queue is, but we have people lined up ready to go. That's not me. He has more hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's all we had here for uh, my announcements. Thank you, Martha. We'll, we'll move on from the key announcements to public comments. Three minutes per person. These are our items. If it's on the agenda, folks, you don't know two bites at the apple. If you're going to talk on your item on the agenda tonight, now, you don't get a second chance to talk on it later. Other than that, please come down and tell us what's on your mind. Mr. Mayor, members of council, um, I wanted to talk briefly, uh, number one, absolutely in favor of hiring the, the consultant on this uh, scope of work, item, uh, agenda item number 14 later. I apologize I won't be here. I've got a, I've got a work call that I need to get on after this. Um, but on the outdoor dining task force with the consultant, I had a really good conversation today with our community development director as well as a senior planner regarding the scope of work. I think you saw my public comment the thousand word, I think I had to try to squeeze everything in there within a thousand words. Um, I think implicitly the, the scope of work is written so that residential issues will be addressed. However, as a contract person and as a, any good contract lawyer will tell you to get it in writing up front, I still would like to see the evaluation of, of potential impacts to residential uses included in the, the actual written scope of work for our, for our consultant. Um, I think the use of the, the business use, I think, is good because it includes not just restaurants, but includes our other retailers, which I think is important. But just the fact that the word residential isn't in, in there or the evaluation of existing uses, uh, potential impacts for existing residential uses, I think really should be uh, engraved in there in the beginning um, so that moving forward five years from now or two years from now or 16 months from now, everybody understands that this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. Um, and those, that's all my comments. Actually, wait, one more thing, changing gears. Chief Johnson isn't here, but a uh, big shout out, completely changing gears. But we've had a number of incidents at our local Vons here over the last few weeks. Police issues, people, ste or people stealing stuff, our kudos to Manhattan PD, Chief Johnson. Um, the response has been absolutely fantastic. I think one 
One of the teenagers they actually brought back made him apologize to the checker, not only return the stuff, but there's some things that are going on with the, with uh, MBPD. Absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And her place is Captain Ike and Lava relay the messages yeah. for you for PD. So thank you for that. Our next speaker, come on down. Hello. I'm Heather Kim, resident and owner of Manhattan Grocery. I spoke at the last city council me meeting, still reeling from the shock about a brazen shoplifting crime that occurred at my family business that not only involved normal theft, but threats of violence to one of my employees by this thug and later by his friend. <coughs> we were hit again, this time by a repeat offender to the tune of over $500, possibly more. I know that might not be much to wealthy people who donated and voted for people like George Gascon, but to small business owners like me, this constant hit we take from shoplifters is truly hurting us. It's hurting my family, our income, and our quality of life. My husband works 12-hour days, seven days a week. And, and I fear for his safety every day. Because you never know when one of these thugs is going to take it to the next level. There is no consequence for people like them. I blame these ideologue politicians for the out of control shoplifting and the crime we are forced to deal with. Um, <laughs> Council Member Haworth, you, um, last time you said maybe you'll um, come by my business more. You know, that's not helping. Buying an extra bag of Doritos doesn't recoup anything for me. You can write me a $500 check right now, and that still doesn't help. What people like me need from you, and other people, all the council members sitting here, is to take actual decisive action. Maybe you can spearhead something against DA Gascon. Maybe we can, I don't know, explore looking into getting our own prosecutor again. I don't know what the answer is, but you guys are smart. You guys are our politicians and our leaders, and you're tasked with keeping us safe. And honestly, I don't feel safe. A lot of my friends and neighbors don't feel safe. Manhattan Beach, I've lived here for over 20 years, has changed so dramatically. And I can tell you, even with these little crimes that I report, I don't know that they're even hitting the, the, the um, weekly crime crime logs accurately. I don't know if each of these people are getting handcuffs on them, taken to the jail, booked like Chief Johnson said they were. She didn't care what Gascon did or didn't do. She was going to do her job, and that means every single person, the protocol should be, every person should not be cited and released and not under police discretion. So we need to change something. There needs to be more help for business owners like myself. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Anyone else? How many comments? <coughs> Mayor and Council, good evening. Good evening. My name is Fred Taylor. I'm a business owner and a 47-year resident of Manhattan Beach. And I rise tonight to speak in behalf of my friend Heather Kim and the two robberies at their uh, personal store called Manhattan Grocery. Not only were hundreds of dollars of merchandise stolen from Manhattan Grocery, but the, theft made, the thief made a public mockery of our city's justice by taunting the Kim, stating, quote, nothing can be done, as he march, marched off with the goods. The Kim family lost property, sustained personal in intimidation, and the brunt of the criminal's hubris to boot. And as yet, the reported crime has not appeared on the Manhattan Beach Department crime reports. The failed uh, criminal policy of L.A. County and George Gascon totally ignores human nature. We all do more of what we're rewarded for and less when we're punished by circumstance. That's why tax revenues paradoxically increase when tax rates are lowered. There's an incentive to work more 
and keep more of what you get. The notion that overlooking criminal behavior will somehow rehabilitate the thief is simply corrupted thinking. In fact, the tragic Park Parkland school shooting in Miami would surely have been avoided if consequences had been meted out on the shooter who had dozens of visits by law enforcement, but no action was ever taken. Gascon has abrogated 50% of his charge duties by refusing to prosecute misdemeanors. The policy is aggravated by cashless bail. As a result, crime is skyrocketing in the county and locally. Now, I want to say this very graciously. Council Member Howarth, you are a public supporter of Gascon and you financially contributed to his campaign. While I do appreciate your recent mea culpa publicly, I urge you to take action with this city council with a vote of no confidence for George Gascon. Quite frankly, it's long overdue. Thank you, Fred. When else have public comments? Hi, Ray Joseph. I don't have anything near at that level. Actually, it's a much lower level, the dog park. This is the water bowl for the dogs. As you can see, it's filled with dirt, mud, and bark. There used to be a bowl, there's a bowl there. There used to be a hose that could go to the bowl. It's been there for years. The hose was removed. I called the city and said, hey, you guys can replace the hose. No one ever got back. They said they're not going to replace the hose. They said the water bowl works satisfactorily. And there was a worker there, and I asked them. They said, nope, satisfactory condition. We removed the old hose. We're not putting it back. My dog runs a lot, and she gets really thirsty. And she just buries her face in the bowl along with other dogs. And the problem is, is being able to fill up a bowl. It would be great if we can get the hose back there so we can, you know, it's been there for as long as I've had the dog, about three years. The hose has been there much longer than that. Can we get the hose back, please? You know, it's not on the huge political, it's way down here, but it would make the dogs happy. Thank you. Great. Leave your picture there with our sister's park. Can I um, Martha? Wait. Okay. And then also, I urge you to use the Go Reach app, Reach MB app. I try. And right. Then just email me and we'll. Okay. Follow it up. Sure. I'm a dog owner myself. I understand that okay. that pain. Bring back the hose. Councilmember Howard, I see you push the button. Yes, I just wanted to ask Mr. Joseph. It's at the dog park right here at Valley, the little dog run. The, yeah, the live oak. Yeah. Live oak, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any more public comments? How about on Zoom, Martha? You have someone? Fine. Please. On mute. On mute, yeah. Yeah. Whoever's on Zoom, please start. All righty, I guess that's me. Is uh, are, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All righty, I believe it's important for a town to honor Memorial Day. I'm here to apologize to all service men and women and their families who were dishonored by Manhattan Beach this past Memorial Day weekend. Your inaction was deafening. Last weekend, Hermosa Beach had an entire stretch of Pier Avenue lined with American flags. In addition to American flags at the foot of the pier, the patriotic display was incredible. Contrast that with nothing from our city. In our town, you wouldn't have even known it was a special day of observance. Shame on you all. There is a one flag in this country, and on Memorial Day, we pay tribute to those who gave the ultimate sacrifice defending that flag. My husband and I served a combined 55 years in the military, willing to lay down our lives for this country. My father and father-in-law served combined 72 years. Our relatives fought in practically every war in this country has had. Our son is headed to his third wartime deployment. Fortunately, when we had our son at Costa, there weren't safe rooms to allow kids to hide from reality. Kids learn to cope with challenges. I noticed the NBUSD schools had assemblies celebrating mental illness right before the Memorial Day weekend instead of patriotic assemblies. 
It's one thing to teach removing the stigma of mental illness and another to celebrate mental illness. Is it any wonder Beach City's health district sponsored these assemblies? The next generation learns our history by the traditions we as adults perform. We either focus on developing victims or developing leaders. Honoring the heroes of yesteryear is a must to developing heroes of tomorrow. Do any of you have any idea what it's like to wait for a loved one to come home? Waiting for a child to return, your spouse, your uncle, your grandfather, I think not. My grandfather fought in World War I. After over five years, he walked in the door without any prior communication. My grandmother fainted. Today marks, as the mayor said, the 79th anniversary of D-Day. My uncle was on the USS Herndon, the first ship to land on the beaches of Normandy, France, June 6th, 1944. The most consequential day of the last century. The men and women of D-Day literally saved the world. It changed the course of history and liberated Europe from Hitler's grasp. Young men displayed the ultimate sacrifice and courage. Remembering is key to honoring the past and preventing a repeat in the future. I ask for a moment of silence for those who have lost their lives defending this country over the past couple hundred years. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with the moment of silence and the fact that we do recognize our veterans at every single meeting, especially today being D-Day. But I agree, the moment of silence, I have no problem with it. Martha, we'll block on a moment here, put everybody else on hold. Thank you all. Martha, whoever's back on Zoom. No other? No close public comment? Count on anybody else public comments? No one else? I'll make one. City Manager Mo, would you put that back on our agenda on a future date, whatever next thing you put it in, to bring back the current update of our multiple efforts we've had with Attorney General, I'm sorry, LA District Attorney Gascon, and Thank the you. fact where we are on homeless court, where we are by state law on a prosecutor, not the theory, not the social media theory, the actual facts of what we, the city, can and cannot do. We're sensitive to Heathers and others that have had issues that although our police, as we recognize tonight, do respond and arrest. It's the prosecution, district attorney's job, not the city's job. So I'd love to put that back on the agenda so the entire community can hear exactly what we've done, what we're doing, and what we can and cannot do. Secondary of that, I want to add, it's not tied to this, but separately. Police, over the emails that I receive, and there are many, and texts, and it's an emergency, folks. Um, fire hydrant gets sheared off. A street collapses. Robbery. You know to call 911. Most of you understand that. Many do not. They rather post to social media and wonder where our police are after the fact. That's a mistake. And I call them all out. And we have a new app here. I forgot what it's called. Help me out. Citizen, Reach, Reach citizen app. Beach. No, the citizen oh. app. Something. Oh. It's not something else. Citizen's a different thing. There was a. There's Whatever. Anyway. There's a secondary. Yeah, yeah, proper notification, whatever. We found out that that, along with that less than call it accurate information next door, have been found to have inaccurate information, which does no one any good. In fact, it causes alarm for no reason. So please understand any questions, call and email us. Call our police department. Do not rely on social media for accuracy, nor a, a <clears throat> way to notify them of a past or current crime. Um, the old adage that we, at least Johnson and Captain Aguilar like to say holds true. She something, say something, do it in real time, not on social media. That's not the way to do it, folks. Don't email counsel after the fact and say, are you aware of this? That's not real time. Call the police. Emergency 911. Our non-emergency number is also to report a crime that's not ongoing at that point in time. Make that very clear. There's some confusion out there about how crimes get reported. It's not email to counsel. It's not the way to do it. Say, Manager Mo, do you have a comment? I do not. We will return with the uh, report on uh, Gascon 
as requested. Thank you. Councilor Howarth? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to sort of amplify uh, your request to Director Mo because it had been on our work plan. We had all talked about it coming back to discuss anyway. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, I'm glad you're asking him to make it a priority to come back, but it is something. Clear, which topic are you talking about? Guest gone. There you go. I mean, we had all talked about that during the work plan, and, and after that, that we want, you know, let's bring it back because you had been working on, you know, prosecuting, you know, services, et cetera. So we, we had placed an importance on that, but I'm glad you reminded and asked him to bring it back for the public. So That's all. I just wanted to amplify that. Thank you. Yes, the, the homeless court issue is on the work plan. We will come back with a, an update on the activities that you want to hear about in advance of that work plan item being presented because that's going to take a little bit more time. So and just one but an item for closure. Just to remind everybody, we are as frustrated, probably more so than you are, to hear about repeat offenders. Mm -hmm. And our police department did a fantastic job. Imagine catching the same burglar twice in one day. That doesn't say it all for you. I don't know what is. So we all want a resolution. There's an election next year. I have to be clear about that. We need a new direction in L.A. County. We need actual enforcement slash prosecution. Half of that we've done. Enforcement can't be better than what we're doing. But prosecution is the missing piece that we all need and deserve. So we'll wait, come back to that on, on, uh, on your schedule, the city manager. Next item up, age consent calendar approval. Uh, I'm sorry. You uh, never done Franklin. Yeah, I just want to clarify. So that's uh, with regards to homeless um, court, but also prosecution services, allowing us to do, to get our own prosecution services. Of misdemeanors. Sorry, misdemeanors. They're related, and, and I believe they'll be in the same report. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate the confirmation. So item H, consent calendar, items three through 10? 10. 10. You have a motion by Member Tim Franklin and a second by Council Napolitano. No further comments. Voting screen, please. Motion passes 5-0. Fantastic. Thank you all. We're going to move to items removed consent calendar. None. Public hearing item 11. Conduct public hearing regarding the proposed five-year capital improvement program. CIP and consideration of resolution for fiscal year 2023-24. Public Director, Director Lee, the floor is yours. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, tonight, it's our pleasure to finally present uh, the recommended uh, five-year CIP for the Council's consideration. Uh, City Engineer Katie Doherty will be doing a very brief presentation, and then we have an adop uh, a recommended adoption of a resolution for your consideration. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Honorable Council members. Um, Katie Doherty, City Engineer. Excuse me. Um, I do have a very, very brief presentation, so I will just jump right in. Um, just to recap quickly um, where we've been so far with the CIP, um, on April 26th, we presented to the Planning Commission for conformance with the general plan. Um, on April 27th, we presented to PPIC. We were here at City Council on May 2nd, May 9th, and May 16th um, to review and discuss uh, the proposed CIP, and we're here tonight for um, final adoption. Um, and just to recap, a quick snapshot, um, the proposed budget includes uh, approximately $49 million in previously appropriated or already allocated funds approximately $49 million in this next coming fiscal year, which uh, begins on July 1st, and um, $61.9 million um, for the out years, years two through five. So it's a total of 84 projects and just over $160 million. Kelly, can over you stop there for a second? I'm sorry. On your screen, can you tell everybody what those four snapshots are of? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, top, uh, let's see, top left is our new fire station number two. Yay. Um, it's, yep, getting stuck. Oh, it's really coming along. It looks great. Um, see, top right is some uh, water main uh, improvements that were done um, near Meadows Elementary School. Uh, bottom left is a slurry, slurry seal coat that is being applied to the streets to preserve it. 
And then bottom right is our new Polywog Lower Playground that is also coming together very nicely. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, so our CIP projects are, are uh, split into eight different categories. Um, just to briefly go through this, I know we've, we've already discussed it. So um, Pretend it's our first time. Okay, sure. Um, so starting, uh, I'll start at the top left at the wastewater fund. Um, there's about 25.8 million in wastewater fund, wastewater funded project or projects, which is one of our enterprise funds. Uh, the stormwater is the next one going down to the left, uh, 37.5 million for stormwater projects. It's also an enterprise fund, but we do have some grant funding in there as well. Um, down at the bottom is the water fund, another enterprise fund, uh, enterprise, enterprise fund, meaning that it's uh, paid by customer rates. Um, 28.1 million there. Um, around to the right is our CIP or, or general fund projects at uh, 20.8 million. Um, the blue wedge at the top right, uh, streets, uh, sidewalks, and right-of-way projects at 43.6 million. And then we have some uh, m more minor funds at the top, street lighting at just over 400,000, uh, pier, state pier and lot at 2.2 million, and the parking fund at 2.5 million up at, up at the top. Um, so that, that's just generally the categories that we kind of loop them into and the, and the funds associated with, you, with each of those categories. And I think I'm at the end. Um, so tonight, uh, staff is recommending that uh, City Council conduct a public hearing and adopt resolution number 230066, approving the five-year CIP as presented, um, and also appropriation of funds for the next fiscal year, fiscal year 2024, that will occur during the adoption of the operating budget, which is following my presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about any of the projects. I'm here. Well said. Stand by one. Colleagues? Councilmember Lesser? Mr. Mayor, I have some questions for the Public Works Director. Yes. Did... My question relates to parking lot three. And it doesn't have to do with the fact that we have money allocated, but it's whether we have sufficient funds, given what I understand is a greater sense of urgency than when I was last on council. My understanding is there was a more recent assessment done on that parking structure. I'm wondering if you can talk about that. I see that $2 million has been allocated for the project over two fiscal years, but what's the timing on the issue, on the need for action, and is there sufficient budget to address what I understand is a more pressing need to take action? Yes. Um, in 2017, uh, there was a seismic study conducted on the structure um, back in, oh, I guess over the last three years, you know, primarily um, the summer of 2021, uh, there was a capital project aimed at doing some uh, needed repair work on the structure to prolong its life. Um, over th the last three years, we've spent about $500,000 um, between design and actual construction funds uh, to keep that structure going. Um, with the latest study that we've done, um, there's uh, significant s seismic deficiencies that um, the engineers have identified. Um, and the, the plan in the council's work plan, along with the CIP, is to uh, take this next year to um, develop a feasibility study of what that property could look like uh, with a, a new constructed parking lot and any other um, uses for that site. Um, the following year, uh, we would hope to design it. Um, and then uh, by the, the year after that, we would hope we'd be um, in a demolition and construction mode, um, which would probably be uh, a multi-year project to actually do that work. Um, but we're looking to do that sooner than later. Um, as far as funding goes, uh, the, the funds that are programmed in the five-year CIP are really in the next fiscal year and in the following uh, to do the work that I described. Uh, we do not have funding identified beyond that, um, and that'd be a, a question really for the, uh, the finance department and the council to consider um, how to bridge that gap, so to speak. And for members of the public, this is the parking lot that's downtown, the large lot. It's right by Morningside, just north of Manhattan Beach Boulevard. And what prompted me to engage with the public works director was realizing that there's sheeting around the perimeter because the railings themselves are failing and because it, there was a subsequent report I thought you wrote in 2020 that identified other issues that necessitated moving quicker. My question is simply, are you comfortable that these are sufficient resources with which to address the more pressing need 
on the yes. lot. Yes, and I think that the council's will to um, engage this as a, as a top level work, at, work plan item for next fiscal year um, really emphasizes that. Thank you. Don't go anywhere yet. Those of you at home that are wondering why we're doing this, this is the fifth public meeting that we've had. Number five. I know my colleagues have all read the books. They know exactly where we are. They've asked all their questions they have, unless it's not in the book. We're at the very end of this process now. There should be no surprises left for anyone up here. Um, so with that, I'll give Director Lee a chance to sit down and catch his breath for a second. But make sure there's no other questions that we didn't think of before. They're not in the staff report. Now's the time to ask them. Anyone? All right, I'll ask one then. Uh, I'll ask Catherine. Catherine, I'll ask you one question. I think you're too humble to mention it. On page three of the staff report, and page 225, for those of you watching at home, you mentioned street sidewalks and right-of-way funds. On the next following page, you list all of the four sources that we, all of you, all of us, get these, where the money comes from. The gas tax fund, what is that, 10 million, 830. Measure M fund, measure R fund, Prop C fund. Anytime you pay tax in LA County, folks, you are paying for this. We are paying for this. What Captain's too humble to tell you is that that's $41 million, $41 million that we're getting back of our own money that we paid out, that we're getting back to pay for all of these things. So it's a shout out that you guys should get and should take. Every chance you get it, shout that out to people. They understand this is a return of their own money back to our own community. So thank you for all that. Put, Director Lee? Yes, Mayor, thank you for that. And you know, another thing that City Engineer Doherty won't mention to you is that her staff aggressively um, works our regional partners for money. Um, and we've got tens of millions of dollars coming um, from these regional um, taxes that are assessed um, on the county. Um, and Manhattan Beach is making sure that we're getting our share. Um, and we're doing that with great skill. So yes. I want to give you a chance to get a shout out, you know, to make sure you understand that these aren't monies they give you folks, the money you get to chase after yeah. to get your own money back. Kind of hand it back to unless you ask and get to go after it. So thank you, staff, for doing that. Captain, directly, it's important to us. With that, no further questions, open up public comment. Who wants to sit there and be happy what we're doing in the next few years? Anyone? Zoom comments, Martha? All right, we'll close public comment. Council? I've made a motion to adopt your Oh, there it is. Oh. A motion to adopt by Council Bolitano and a second by Councilor Holworth. Voting screen, please. Motion passes 5 0. Fantastic. Thank you all. A lot of hard work, isn't that? Thank you all for that one. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would like to compliment Eric and Katie and the entire public works staff for the well thought out plan uh, many months of work went into that well thought out and and comprehensive and obviously delved into all the items that we need to be considering these five years ahead of us so thank you to the staff what a million dollars a pop is a good return i like that let's hear next item number 12. Uh, oh sorry there it comes up again public hearing and consideration of resolution adopting the fiscal year 23-24 operating budget and the GAN Approaches Limit with Director Trillian to lead the way here. Thank you and good evening, Honorable Mayor Montgomery and members of the City Council, Steve Trillian, Finance Director. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank all the department heads and budget leads for their efforts in putting this fiscal year 23-24 spending plan together. I also want to acknowledge the uh, support of management services taking the lead on performance measures and department analytics, as well as the design uh, and the graphics you see in the, in the document. Uh, lastly, the budget uh, finance de development team uh, of Libby Bredhauer, Marcelo Serrano, and Julie Bondarchuk for a dedicated uh, dedication to deliver a balanced budget before you tonight. We are very fortunate to have such a talented workforce. The budget takes uh, about six months to put together, along with department meetings, community meetings, budget study sessions, and city council meetings. This process is transparent, collaborative, and well thought out. Most importantly, keeping City Council's priorities of public safety and maintaining essential services in the forefront, as well as community priorities and City Council work plan items. Tonight serves as a public hearing for the fiscal year 23-24 uh, proposed, uh, I'm sorry, operating budget. Uh, this is an overview of the proposed operating budget. 
uh, with also changes to the proposed operating budget, which will be uh, in Exhibit A, as well as resolutions for adoption, adoption 2367, which is the operating budget, and 2368, which is the GAN appropriation limit. Spending plan uh, supports the City Council priorities, uh, emphasis on public safety and maintaining essential services. Revenues are stable and growing. Uh, most of them are above key levels in pre-pandemic levels. Uh, balanced budget has a surplus of $475,000. Uh, city's AAA credit rating is reaffirmed with S&P in 2021. And overall financial positions allow us to reinvest in service level, maintenance and infrastructure corresponding with community priorities and city council work plan. We also uh, have FEMA reimbursement submittals. We have five more applications uh, submitted for a total of 819,000. A few weeks ago, I was uh, happy to report that we got our first $81,000. So uh, stay tuned, we'll be updating regularly on those uh, as, they, as they come in in the next fiscal year. The proposed budget includes full impacts of the public safety positions that were added in this current year, fiscal year 23, with eight sworn positions, seven in police and one in fire, and five civilian support positions, three of those in police and two of them in fire. Additionally, service delivery investments across all funds are a total of 523,000, with two full-time positions totaling 215,000, and that's one in community development and one in public works. Also added part-time positions of $258,000 uh, throughout the departments, as well as additional uh, adjustments totaling um, 49900 We have a few modification identified in Exhibit A of Resolution 2367. During the budget study session, City Council directed to add $10,000 for printing advertising for older adult programming and services. Staff also added $27,000 from the Police Safety Grant Fund for an additional uh, portable live view surveillance trailer. And lastly, a reimbursable amount of $48,567 for the CIMP admin fees. Uh, there's also an offset on the revenue side for this. This is a total reimbursement item. With the 23-24 budget adoption, we will maintain policy reserves of $18.6 million dollars. $4 million in economic uncertainty reserve, and $4 million in unreserved for a total of $26.6 .6 million in reserves, in total reserves. Uh, the impacts to the general, general fund will continue to be stormwater and street lighting, uh, to the tune of $3 million for both of those subsidies from the general fund, and we'll be coming back with the stormwater analysis in the first meeting of September. Uh, we also transferred a $1 million to uh, the Senior Scout House project earlier this year. Uh, transfer to the pension policy from savings of issuance of the pension obligation bonds are $492,000 as well as $994,000 to the CIP fund. And our pension stabilization fund uh, has an accrued amount estimated around $3.2 million for this fiscal year. Our general fund uh, has a strong uh, revenues and balanced budget, uh, $475,000 surplus, and services, uh, essential services are maintained. We have investments aligned with the city council work plan. Uh, we have the consultants develop comprehensive long-term outdoor dining, $250,000 from the general fund, historic preservation resource survey, $20,000 from the general fund, comprehensive parking management study of $250,000 from the parking fund, and the redesign and repurpose of the slab fountain at Metlocks in $250,000 coming from the parking fund. Staff recommends that the City Council conduct a public hearing and adopt Resolution 2367, adopting the fiscal year 23-24 operating budget and authorizing the City Manager to take certain personnel-related actions as identified in, in the resolution. Also, adopt Resolution 2368, establishing the GAN appropriation limit for 23-24. The GAN limit is a proposition, it was a proposition approved by the voters in the late 70s with the goal of setting government spending uh, cap and appropriation limit. The city's current GAN limit is 99.3 million. The city has about 30.8 million remaining in appropriation capacity, well within our limit and within state law. 
I would like to point out a necessary correction to Resolution 2368 to reflect the correct appropriation capacity of 30.8 million and available percentage of limit of 31.1 percent. So um, with that said, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you, Director Shurian. Again, folks, this is the fifth meeting we've all had together with staff to walk us through our budget for next year. A very important document for all of us and all of you. With that, I'll ask my colleagues for any questions they might have for Director Shurian. Anyone in finance? Any other question? Councilmember Lesser. Dr. Director Shurian, can you point out exactly what that correction is that you proposed at the very end? I want to make sure I have it written down. It's in the errata sheet, right? Yeah, there was an errata sheet sent. They passed this out on the counter earlier to all of us. Yeah, yeah. Here. Thank you. I didn't get it. Thank you. I took two. Yeah. See what page number it is? Got it? Got it. Yeah. All right. Anyone else have any questions or comments on Councilor Howarth? Is comment? Is yes. Comment? Um, you know, I do want to point out to the general public uh, the money that this council uh, is happily appropriating for public safety. Um, seven sworn police positions with three civilian police positions as well as the fire positions plus another 27,000 for an additional surveillance trailer for downtown. This is um, a huge commitment by this council to public safety. Uh, it is we all want uh, everybody to feel safe and we are doing um, what we can do here uh, to make that happen. It's a big commitment and it's absolutely uh, appropriate and worth it. Thank you. Well said. Anyone else? All right. Public uh, comment, please. Mayor, before the public comment, just to clarify the clerical error. Yes. Um, the draft resolution in the agenda had a number of 26 million and some change. All right. There's actually an additional 4 million in reserve or appropriation capacity. And to turn that as page 376 of 610, is that the correct page? Yes. I think so. I'm just looking at the resolution. So we actually have four more, four million more. So 30.8 million is the appropriation capacity. We always like positive numbers like that. 31 percent. The capacity of us as a percentage went from 26 percent to 31 percent. Yes. We're nowhere near that number, thank God. The city manager's reserve fund. <laughs> Reserve any other council comments? Then public comment, please. The single most important document next to CIP, and they say, this is it, folks. This is the one you really want to pay attention to. Seeing none on Zoom? None. All right. Close public comment. Council? A first proposal by Councilor Howard, a second by Councilor Lesser. I'll just add my favorite thing on page seven of the support, page 384. The key two sentences you want to pay attention to. General fund has strong revenues and a balanced budget. First one. Surplus of 475,017. Not many folks, cities in California folks can say that. Most us, the rest of the country, you should be awfully proud of what your finance team has done to get us here. None of us here are experts in finance. This whole team you see behind me and in front of me, they're the ones that make everything happen here. So kudos to you, Director Shore, and your team for getting us here. With that, we'll call for the uh, voting screen, please. Just, for, just to clarify, it will be to adopt Resolution 230067 and 230068 as amended. Noted. Voting yep. screen. Motion passes 5 0. All right, great. Thank you all. And Mr. Mayor, uh, yes. as with the public work staff, I do want to recognize finance for their hard work. Again, many months went into this, a lot of skill and, and effort uh, on, on Steve's, Libby's, Marcello's, and Julie's part. Uh, this doesn't happen by accident, as you pointed out, and so uh, they should be recognized as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, you want to take a break one now for this long report on homelessness? What are you going to do? You ready now or let George continue? Straight through? All right. Okay. Good. Our next item up.
Let's do our business. Item 13, the quarterly update on the city's homeless initiative. And I'll stop there and let Assistant City Manager George Gabriel take over. Hi, I'm Mayor Montgomery and members of the City Council. George Gabriel, Assistant to the City Manager. Um, tonight, I'll be providing a quarterly update on homeless initiatives. Uh, the last time we provided this update, I think, was sometime in February uh, to the City Council. And so we attempt to give updates on metrics uh, as well as what the staff is observing in terms of homelessness and uh, through a variety of initiatives that we're proceeding with. So uh, this may be somewhat repetitive, but I always try to remind the community of this is the significant invest, uh, investments, uh, funding and resources uh, that the city has uh, endeavored in. And so as you can see, we have our initial uh, Measure H grant of 330000 We have another 216000 um, Our outreach navigator contract um, in total over about two years, about 139, And then for share housing beds for five years or for two years, um, for five beds was about is about thirty eight thousand as well, so uh, something the city should be proud of in terms of uh, what we're doing to address homelessness in terms of trying to uh, meet the demand, but also uh, meet the uh, monetary contributions that's necessary to meet the demand. So our homeless count over the years. <coughs> As you can see from 2015 to 2018, um, or 2015 to 2017, it was relatively stable, and then 2018 it shot up, and this is the uh, homeless count conducted by the Los Angeles uh, Homeless Services Authority. <coughs> it went to 41 in 2018, but since we've been investing in this and, and putting additional resources, that number has gone down all the way to nine in 2022. 2023, that number is to be determined officially. However, I can give you the unofficial numbers tonight. Can't wait for that number to be lower. So the unofficial 2023 homeless count, um, I've separated into unsheltered persons counted and in vehicles and dwellings counted. As you can tell, the number of persons counted is at nine. Uh, while, while the vehicle and dwellings counted is 14, and the breakdown is listed in the PowerPoint slide. Um, the reason why there is a separation here is because one is pr uh, predicated on a conversion factor, and one is based off of the um, number of individuals that is actually counted. And so uh, unsheltered persons counted, that's pretty, uh, it's pretty stable compared to prior years, and that in total is nine. The vehicles and dwellings counted has significantly increased. Last year we had one, and this year uh, we have 14. And so it's noteworthy because that number is going to be subject to losses conversion factor. And this conversion factor is losses, uh, uh, what, what LASA uses to estimate the number of homeless individuals within a vehicle or dwelling. Uh, when it may be unclear or unsafe for vehicles located or for individuals located in those dwellings or vehicles to be counted. So um, this has been a practice that has been in the, that LASA has had for many years now. It does have some controversy um, and some opinions on it. Uh, that being said, um, this is the practice that they do. And um, for our purposes, we expect uh, there may be an increase in terms of ho uh, the homeless count from prior years, but if we just take a look at the unsheltered persons counted, that is relatively stable compared to prior years. Mr. Mayor, could I ask a question? Yes, about, I'm sorry, Councilor Howard. Uh, could I ask a, just yeah. a question about the conversion factor? So that means when it is observed that there's somebody perhaps living in a vehicle, losses saying they can convert that, they can maybe estimate maybe it's two people, not one. Or because they can say, well, it looks like it's a family there. Like, does that what that means? So uh, what LASA does, and I'll, I'll put it in, in an example. Yeah. Um, so uh, a, a homeless count volunteer uh, locates a uh, camper, an RV, okay. that has that is suspected of having homeless individuals because it may have a condition that is consistent with a homeless individual residing in there. Uh, LASA takes that one count 
And then based off of their statistical analysis, based off of how many individuals are typically in the uh, in vehicles in our spa, in our service planning area, they attribute a conversion factor. Okay. So for every one camper RV that's counted, there could be a conversion factor of, I think it's about 2.2, let's say. Okay. So instead of counting one individual for that camper RV, they're counting 2.2. Okay. And so those conversion factors obviously vary between cars, vans, makeshift shelters, and tents, with cars having a lower conversion factor and campers, RVs, having a larger conversion factor. Thank you. I will add on to that comment, Councilor Hilbert's comment. The most frustrating thing that um, in Palatine I've seen since 17, imagine this trickle-up accounting where the county adds 2.2, whatever number you have, it could be zero, they add 2.2. Imagine your numbers with if real life actual accounting worked that way, 2.2 to every number you add to them. So in my real life, that number 14 is not real. It is a mythical made up number by the county adding 2.2 to every number you come up with. So in my mind, we're well below nine. It's because of the hard work you've done, George, and your team, and, and Lawson and others, and our Inner Harbor interview, they've done all the hard work. I don't pay attention to mythical numbers, but I'll stop and let it continue. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, continuing on, uh, we have outreach statistics based off of what we have with our uh, co uh, contract with the county as well as the South Bay City's Council of Governments. And so here are some, here are some data from March 2022 of May 2023. We have 601 outreach interactions. And obviously, uh, there are duplicates in that number. We have 98 participants served, 11 housing referrals attained, and then 14 stable housing placements. And keep in mind, this number is not just Manhattan Beach, it's also El Segundo, it's Redondo Beach, uh, and it's Hermosa Beach. And it goes to the effort that we take in not only addressing our homeless population, but addressing the regional population because uh, we all know that homeless individuals traverse across all the beach cities. And so, as it relates to Manhattan Beach, uh, these are numbers that are, uh, that are primarily reflective of our dedicated outreach navigator. And so from March to May, March 2022 to May 2023, uh, we've had 422 interactions, 91 participants served, 27 interim housing referrals attained, and 17 stable housing uh, placements. And so I just want to highlight the difference between interim and stable is one is a short-term uh, placement versus the long-term one, uh, likely for longer than a year in some instances. And so special attention should be played to that 27 number that I think uh, the city should be particularly proud of because it directly relates to the, to the other investment the city has taken with the Share Collaborative Housing Program. And so if you look at the sh number of share housing placements, we've had 27 referrals attained that I just referred to, 14 individuals were placed in the share housing with city funding over that time, nine individuals were placed with MB Safe funding. Um, and uh, I say that, you know, we're very thankful to have an active nonprofit that uh, is willing to, you know, contribute uh, to addressing homelessness in our community, but also supplement it with funding necessary to the Share Collaborative Housing Program. And I should say most of these individuals, if not all of these individuals that were placed were prior to the city increasing for, from two to five beds. So there's not as much of a reliance on MB Safe to address this, and therefore we've, um, we definitely addressed it by increasing the number of beds already. So it's not as big of an issue. Um, another thing that is highlighted at the top right is a occupancy rate, and that's the number of beds that are full um, that the city places uh, individuals into. And so we have about a 78% occupancy rate, so give or take about four, to, four out of five beds are full on a monthly basis. So uh, I wanted to highlight this slide particularly because I know some questions about grant funds has been uh, questioned by the city council. And so the Measure H grant funds were separated into round one and round two, also known as the, the ones that were allocated in 2020 and the ones allocated in 2022. And so uh, the city has had $546,000 allocated in grant funds to the beach cities um, in round one. Uh, there is a slight balance. That one's probably going to be folded into round two uh, recent, uh, soon, I should say. And then the round two funds, that's, the, that's obviously there's a gap between the 
funds that have been awarded and expended, and that's because that round is still going. Um, we expect that round two funding to, to continue until November of 2024, the last list, until we reapply for new grant funding. Uh, in terms of general fund money, um, we're in line and uh, targeted with um, how much we've appropriated versus expended. And so as you can tell, uh, we're about halfway through our dedicated outreach navigator contract. Um, and uh, that contract expires, I believe, in December. And so we'll obviously fully utilize those funds, and then I'll come back to the city council uh, if they want, if they would like a, another appropriation. And in terms of shared collaborative housing, um, those numbers are being expended, and we anticipate most of those funds to be extended by the end of July. So, share contract status. So, the share collaborative housing contract does expire uh, this month, actually, in June 2023. Uh, we've been negotiating with share for that contract uh, to present uh, an agreement for council consideration. Um, that uh, agreement that they or the fund request that they uh, communicated to the city council was ten thousand dollars four hundred or ten thousand four hundred seventeen dollars on a monthly basis for five beds. Obviously, that is well above what the city currently contributes, which is about give or take four thousand uh, dollars. Given this large delta in terms of the city's uh, current funding, as well as uh, what their funding request is. We put a request to the South Bay City's Council of Governments. Uh, the South Bay City's Council of Governments has committed to funding up to five beds for the city and offering the entire region uh, share beds for use. Um, and so I should say that the South Bay City has committed to it not only because they've seen this work in, other, in another COG, but also because they've seen the success that Manhattan Beach has had with the shared collaborative housing program. And obviously they want to offer this to uh, the rest of the region. Can I stop there for a second? Go ahead. South Bay Cog is committed to funding up to five beds for the city of Manhattan Beach Correct. and offering the entire region share beds for use. So let's say we move from 78% occupancy to 100% occupancy. We can use additional beds that were not assigned to us? So the way share collaborative housing works, um, we have a commitment to utilize five beds. The beds are not assigned until you... Uh, engage with the outreach navigator and then uh, they contact the landlord who would be interested in housing that individual so to this moment we have not had an issue with availability of share housing beds but if you did if we did an option available to exceed the five that we have is it the last line the entire region share beds for use yeah yes all right the answer to that is yes yeah. we exceed that five we can jump into it flexibility others if we need them there there is flexibility perfect thank you um, so the plan going forward in terms of the contract status is once funds are fully expended with the city's current contract the city will then transition to utilizing the uh, cogs measure H funding provided by the county uh, ideally in August 2023 so that the goal of that is to ensure that those gap of, there's no gap of service obviously you see that our contract expires in June and uh, theirs may be in August, you're going to tell me, well, where, there's a gap there. Where, what's going to happen? We'll likely utilize some uh, cost savings and extend the contract just for one uh, month so that we can get to August of 2023. So in terms of homeless outreach requests, we had 128 uh, outreach requests submitted. Uh, council will recall that we launched this outreach category within the Reach Manhattan Beach app. Um, it's been fairly active, and I, I myself uh, look at these outreach requests with our outreach navigator as well as the Manhattan Beach Police Department, and uh, we go over these on a weekly basis, and we try to uh, either problem solve or get updates as to how we are addressing each one. And uh, in terms of homeless court, obviously it's very timely considering our earlier earlier discussion, and so I did want it. I did touch upon it in the staff report and. City Council did direct to add a work plan item aimed at creating a homeless court diversion program. Staff has met internally uh, and working with the city attorney to explore options with how the city can mirror homeless courts in an informal pre-court filing format. Um, staff projects to return to the city council in the fall with options for council consideration. And um, obviously prosecution is, a, is an element of it 
um, but that element is more related to a, a, the draft contract that was approved with uh, with the city of Redondo Beach. So um, we'll see how how things progress on that front. So to conclude, staff recommends that the city council receive and follow the updates. Uh, additionally, there are two contracts uh, for the city council's approval. One is amendment number four with Harbor Interface Services, which basically is the subcontract for those grant those grant funded services with the COG. And then uh, the additional resolution is approving the memorandum of understanding with the COG as well as the four uh, or three other beach cities uh, for those uh, subcontracted case management services. That concludes my presentation. And I should mention that uh, Ronson Chu, the senior project manager for the South Bay City Council of Governments, is available tonight as well. And um, I have to give a personal shout out to Ronson. He's been instrumental with uh, assisting not only the beach cities, but he's responsible for homelessness amongst the whole uh, the whole COG. And uh, he does a great job of it. Responsible for, for overseeing the homeless issue, the program. Yes. yes. Not responsible for homeless. That's true. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank, Thank you. We you really have some questions. Yes. Uh -huh. So well said. Stand by there, colleagues. Any questions? I see. Uh, Mayor Tim Franklin first, then Councilor Lesser. Yes. Uh, th thank you, George, and thank you uh, to the homeless outreach team. Thank you uh, for everybody in the city that's involved with this. The uh, the Reach the Beach app to report uh, encounters with, with homeless is uh, very effective. It uh, I think it, it takes away. Um, the fear for residents to go ahead and report. So we see that in the results. I just want to confirm. So on your slide, uh, slide five, where you talk about the outreach statistics for the Beach Cities region, mm -hmm. you show 601. Is it possible to bring that back up? Give us one second. I'm pulling it back up. So be slide five, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, this, this one. Yeah. So right there. So that's the that's the uh, essentially the four cities, right? Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach. Yes. And El Segundo. So six oh one number of outreach, ninety eight number of participants served. So then on the next page, you see that Manhattan Beach uh, has 422 number of outreach. So that's 70% of the four cities has been done by Manhattan Beach. Well, that's a little, that's a little bit of a problematic um, conclusion to draw. And the reason, the reason I say that is because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we have duplicate interactions. And because of the duplicate interactions, one thing that we benefit from uh, from having a dedicated resource is that we have uh, our dedicated outreach navigator makes repeated interactions. Um, because the uh, the beach outreach is conducted amongst one person, well, one and a half individuals over four cities, they do not have the luxury of uh, making repeated interactions because they're spread out over. Uh, larger area and so um, I can't say definitively that you know those interactions may count for may count for 70 percent just Manhattan Beach um, just because of the duplicate nature of those interactions okay but still the, the other stats as well it's a higher number for Manhattan Beach it appears. yeah and I think I think it's a direct result out of the the, the dedicated outreach resource okay yeah. All right, great. Uh, no more questions for right now. Thank you. Councilor Belesser. So uh, first and foremost, thank you, George, for your presentations tonight, but also your work throughout the year in your, your office. And I also wanted to join in shouting out to Ronson, too, of the South Bay COG, who has uh, been terrific in the presentations that I've heard him present. He also has hosted a number of fora for elected officials to try and get a better understanding of what the issue is and what it um, our opportunities are in this region to try and address them. So thank you, Ronson, for all of your work. Um, I had a similar question along with Mayor Pratem as to better understanding the unofficial count 
and what is likely to be the official count in connection with what we're seeing on this very chart that was brought up. The staff report notes how there were 91 unique clients assisted in our city, yet on the night that where was the count, we have a total of nine individuals, 14 vehicles and dwellings. How do you, the reason for the question is people are asking to what extent do we have an issue with homelessness? How many homelessness, home, homeless individuals are there in our city? And how do you compare the numbers that we're seeing in this overall number of encounters yeah. with the numbers that were counted on that evening? So, um, great question, Councilmember Lester. With relation to the 91 participants served, you got to remember that this is over a long duration. So a lot of these individuals, while they may come to the city, doesn't mean they stay in the city. And one of the things that, one of the reasons why the count is conducted at the time it is conducted is that is that what we're looking for with the count is individuals that are sleeping in the city. And one of the things that we see in Manhattan Beach and the beach cities in, in general is that there are many people that traverse the beach cities. It doesn't always mean that, the, that these individuals stay in Manhattan Beach. Um, one of the things that, like I said earlier, that we have a benefit from from having a dedicated outreach resource is that Myra is even able to make contact with that individual that's just passing through and see, can we assist those? Obviously, her focus is going to be on the individuals that stay and dwell in the city on a regular basis because we're really looking for a long-term or interim uh, resource for them. Um, with uh, relation to the number of individuals that we count, uh, we do keep, uh, you know, we do, we do try to attempt at looking at the number of individuals that are currently in the city on a weekly, monthly basis. And one of the things that we see is that there's different uh, categories of those individuals. There are individuals that stay in Manhattan Beach. There are individuals that stay in the Beach Cities area. There are people that just pass through. And there are people that we're working with ongoing case management. And there are people that we placed in homeless case management, or not homeless case management, but the SHARE uh, Collaborative Housing Program. And so um, I think prior counts is probably fairly accurate, in my opinion, in terms of having a, a consistent homeless count of anywhere from 5 to 10 because that's really what we see uh, in Manhattan Beach. And can you repeat for the benefit of any members of the public watching this, what the protocol should be if someone observes an individual that's Yes. Mm -hmm. So if they're, um, upon witnessing uh, an individual who is homeless in Manhattan Beach, they should assess whether it is a public safety threat or not. And if it, there is a public safety threat that exists, um, if it is an emergency, obviously, call 911. If it is not an emergency, well, the city's police department has a non-emergency line. If there is an individual that, is, that uh, the public will just simply like to refer to the city for outreach resources, obviously, the Reach Manhattan Beach app is a great resource for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Thank you, George. We'll sit back to anything else. Uh, public comment on this item? <coughs> City Council members, uh, good evening. Uh, Ronson Chu, uh, I lead homeless services for the South Bay City's Council of Governments. Uh, I just want to say, um, you know, the South Bay City's Council of Governments, we enjoy our partnership with the City of Manhattan Beach uh, in trying to reduce homelessness in, in this area uh, for the past couple of years. Um, we um, are especially, you know, thankful of the investments and the leadership you've made, uh, you know, with our contracts to house those 31 people that George uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of hard work, but, you know, we're seeing progress, and that's good. The, unfortunately, though, we are seeing, or we are facing a tough year. You know, we're seeing high inflation. We have a lot of families dealing with uh, the tightening of their purse, pockets, uh, what have you. And also, we're seeing seniors on fixed income dealing with this inflationary environment. Um, I was just told last week uh, we have 200 families in the South Bay uh, on the wait list, just to talk to someone. They're not even waiting for a shelter. They're just waiting to talk to someone. Uh, so that's how backed up we are on the case management side. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, to put in perspective, that's, that's about 400 kids. Uh, so so there, is, there has been an influx that we're seeing this year 
Fortunately, though, with, with these contracts and additional investments that we're making at the, at the COG, we're hoping to mitigate some of these trends that we're seeing. Uh, in addition to the case management and also the shared housing, we're looking to uh, provide uh, subsidized rentals uh, for folks. Uh, we also want to uh, hire a housing navigator uh, to help our case managers locate uh, more housing resources. Uh, we're also looking to hire a document specialist to help with uh, our, our homeless uh, neighbors with their documents like driver's licenses, birth certificates, things like that to help them get housing. So hopefully with these investments, again, uh, we hope to make more progress and mitigate some of the trends that we're seeing. And also special shout out to George. Uh, I know he wears many hats for your, for your city, uh, but uh, I'm very, I've been really impressed by the knowledge he has on the homelessness issues and he speaks really, really well uh, about those issues. So thank you. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate it. The work you guys are doing. Who else has public comment on this item? Martha, anybody on Zoom? Uh, somebody on Okay, iPhone 3, you're up. Hello? Hi, this is, can you hear me? Yes, Lucia. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry. This is a new phone, and I don't know how to give him my name. Uh, my name is Lucia La Rosa Inns, and I am with uh, and be safe. And um, I want to uh, first of all thank, uh, thank, thank personally um, George. Um, is uh, a, 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 a is an amazing resource for the city. Always available uh, even after work time, seven o'clock to midnight. And uh, so uh, it's been pivotal for changing the dynamic. And um, I also want to echo with the last person said that uh, um, we will have a problem with families uh, and uh, the current contract does not cover that specific need. Um, and this is has been interacting with uh, and has helped house uh, three families in the last month. And, uh, uh, and uh, um, Maya uh, could not even interact with them because it was not covered by the contract. And one family was unified with the relatives, and the other two, we really we had to struggle ourselves to find a solution. Rita has been amazing to find solutions for them because there are not many shelters for families. There are perhaps shelters for um, men, for women with kids, but when you have men and a woman and children, multiple children, then they become complicated. And so, I think that uh, I would suggest that to the new contract with our greater faith address, because um, I see it's going to be in, in need in the future. Also for the, the immigrants that uh, have been, uh, you know, bused to California, uh, I can see that that will uh, increase the um, homeless population composed by family in the future. And uh, so this is my comment. Thank you very much. Ciao, Chia. Thank you. Our next speaker. Diane All right, Diane. Um, good evening. I, I'm just calling in because I wanted to thank uh, George for such a good and comprehensive report. Thanks. Thank you, Diane. Our next speaker. We'll close public comment. Council? Comments, questions, anything? Mayor Pro Tim Franklin? Yes, just want to officially. Your punch, thank you. Okay. Um, Measure H was passed uh, in 2017. Uh, it raises about, uh, you know, it's a quarter percent sales tax, and it raises about uh, $355 million a year. Um, so that's eventually going to you know, raise billions of dollars here. And it seems like, I'm not going to say we cracked the code, but we see a lot of um, grand plans and things like that. But it's basically comes down to this, and I've seen it personally, and I think my fellow council members have seen it, is it's hard work. <laughs> it is really, bottom line, hard work. And we're very fortunate that we got city staff that's dedicated, that we got Interfaith Harbor Services that, is, you know, that are dedicated. Myra is very dedicated. The um, mental um, clinician, 
dedicated, uh, not, something that was not mentioned was also the additional training that we give to our police officers and how to handle homeless individuals. And um, th th those officers are there all the time. In fact, if they weren't there, the housing navigator in many cases wouldn't even go and approach the homeless individual. So uh, it's a lot of commitment. Uh, I think there's been a lot of trial and error. And it's just, um, I, I think we've simplified it. And, um, but it's still very, you know, a lot of hard work. Um, it kind of makes me a little nervous where we have this funding gap and share bids. I'm hoping that it'll be picked up in August by the COG, okay? Because we've shown that we've made a commitment by paying um, uh, $10,000, $10,400 a year for, for the five beds. I don't know how many years, two years now, George, or 15 months or something like that. And, and that's really the key. I mean, we have a place to put these individuals. Now, if they want to move, you know, if they don't want to do that, they have a decision, they can go ahead and move on, uh, or they can go ahead and work with us. Uh, there's also been, it hasn't been talked about too much tonight, but repatriation with the homeless individuals, where they actually, uh, in talking to Myra, and talking to the mental clinician, uh, find out it's a problem at home. And then between Myra, the mental clinician, individual, individuals at MB Safe, they determine and help them reconcile with their families. And that way they don't even have to enter into services, they go home. And MB Safe is there with a funding solution to get those people. We've seen it, um, I don't see anybody here from MB Safe, but uh, there have been multiple, more than a handful of repatriations, and that just, that's very efficient, it saves a lot of time, saves a lot of money, but they're there as an immediate funding source to do that, so I encourage people to contribute. It's a 5013C, it's very well run. Uh, the people are very compassionate, and they're hardworking hand in hand, you know, with the, uh, with the city state staff and the Interfaith Harbor Services staff. So, um, I went back to the Measure H because there's just a lot of money out there. I just think it needs to be appropriated in, in the correct way. Uh, the part-time housing navigator, we saw it just wasn't effective. I would hope that the COG could, could uh, do something with the other beach cities because really when you step back, we're all interconnected, right? A homeless individual walks from El Segundo to, to Manhattan to, you know, to... Um, Hermosa Beach and Redondo Beach. So it's really this one big system. And if we just had as many resources as possible, and it's not an exorbitant amount when you, when you consider what's been collected. And I know that there's a lot that has to go on with funding homelessness with, you know, permanent supportive shelters and things like that. But still, if, if it can be done the right way, I think it's gonna be a lot more effective. And selfishly speaking, for the South Bay cities, uh, I'd like to see more of that. I, uh, you know, our team has worked very, very hard with great results. That's why I wanted to make mention of the fact that that, um, you know, it's not an anomaly, but just the fact that Manhattan Beach was responsible for a great deal of the, uh, of the successful placements and reconciliations and things like that recognizing too it's very very hard work and we are so blessed to have uh to have the staff but also uh and be safe so i would um like to uh uh go ahead and uh oh well we already have the motions <laughs> there i was going to lead that to a motion but i'll I, thank you i'll withdraw and you can you can make no, it no, if you might. Yeah. okay we know so many comments but i'll wrap up here uh, I just came back to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and we sat, the California mayors sat together, and Mayor Bass uh, led all the L.A. County cities together, talking about her frustration with the fact she wants uh, Congress to send the money to, to cities, bypass Sacramento, bypass L.A. County, which, of course, we all love that one. Her reasoning, which I agree with 100%, was that the cities are the only ones close to the ground and know what's going on. Do you imagine what would happen if money actually came to the city and bypassed the state and the county? They'd have a corner in Sacramento, but they wouldn't like it. But I, I think it's a great idea. Um, and those of you who are watching the first time that we're talking about this, that it's a team effort, as Mayor Tim Franken talked about. It isn't the five of us. It starts George and the PD and our fire and Myra and Harbor Interfaith and the COG. They're the ones that drive all that. 
we see the results of it and reports up here, but it's they're the front line for us. Um, until Lucia Ames and her NB Safe team, we can't thank them enough. They are private nonprofit. They're not they're not the city funds, and they raise their own money privately. But they integral part to our success. So a shout out to them. It's unfortunate that both Heather Kim and Fred Taylor left for this part because if you look at item or page three, page three, what is it, eight nine? It says that George and we sent a letter to Governor Newsom in support of the framework for community assistance recovery and empowerment care core program, which would use the judicial system to compel people suffering from severe mental illness and or addiction into treatment and for those who are unhoused or refused to their housing resistant into housing. So, which, uh, Heather gave us an emotional statement today about people coming out to say we can't do anything about it. Let's just take one of those things away. Well, we can do something about it. I want them to hear that. They're not here tonight to hear that piece of it, but it's one more thing the city is doing they should be aware of. We're not sitting on our hands up here. I wish they would have stayed to understand that part of it. But all my colleagues' comments are right up the right way to do it, and no further comments. We'll do a uh, voting screen, please. Is there um, more? Uh, the, just a uh, quick clarification and an additional comment. Um, the uh, agenda title is, uh, when making the motion, please reference the uh, the resolution indicated on the agenda title. I believe it's resolution 7-3 and 7-4 ending. Um, there's a slight discrepancy with the PowerPoint. And so please refer to 7-3 and 7-4 when adopting. Uh, and then the, the comment I'd like to make and uh, what I was remiss in making in my presentation is that um, very uh, thankful for the Manhattan Beach Police Department. They dedicate not only two police officers to our homeless outreach team, but they have supervisors in terms of the sergeant and lieutenant that works towards uh, uh, addressing homeless individuals. And so whenever I have a question, they're the ones that are out in the street and getting information and understanding what's occurring. So I just want to say uh, tremendous kudos and thank you to the Manhattan Beach Police Department. I second that. Thank you. So, Mr. Mayor, I'll, that Dr. was what Howard, we... You're going to second that? Third well, that? Well, I made the motion, and I just wanted to add to the motion. The motion is to adopt resolutions number 73 and 74. Perfect. So you're saying our screens are correct? Yeah. Perfect. So we have first and a second. Time. Thank you for that clarification. Motion passes 5-0. All right. Thank you, everyone. You want to take a break? I would break. Do a break yeah. We'll do a quick break, folks. It is um, Apple Time, 742. We'll meet here at 752. 752. Ten minutes.
live our council reconvene after our short break on item 14 consideration of awarding an RP and adopted resolution approving a professional services agreement with more I can't pronounce that. That's Goldsman to develop the long term outdoor dining and business use program led by Convener Martelli and Mirzakanian. The floor is yours. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Um, tonight I would like to hand it off to our senior planner, Jay Hee Yoon, who is the project manager for this effort, to walk you through our pres brief presentation. Fantastic. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm Senior Planner Jay Hee Yoon, and the item before you is to consider a professional services agreement with MIG for the long-term outdoor dining program. provide you with some background, in August 2021, the City Council provided direction to staff to pursue a work plan item for long-term outdoor dining and business uses in the right-of-way and on private property. And in February of this year, the City's temporary outdoor dining program came to an end, and in the following month, in March, the City issued a request for proposal to retain the services of a planning professional to assist us in supplementing the resources and expertise that we currently do not have available in-house, but also to expedite the process of developing a permanent program at the speed desired by the community. We received one proposal, which is from Moore Icafino Goldsmith Inc., which is commonly known as MIG. And they are a national full service planning and urban design firm. And from MIG, they will be providing expertise in land use planning, urban design, landscape design, community outreach, civil engineering, and environmental studies. They'll also be bringing on board subconsultants. The first is Fair and Peers for transportation planning. EPS for fiscal analysis and public financing and Sandra Miles to look at ADA compliance measures. The proposed work scope includes document research, which will be reviewing existing policies and regulations in place, such as the municipal code, the local coastal program, and the general plan. They'll also be conducting a SWOT analysis to propose strategies that can build on the findings of their research. And the engineering and design guidelines will also be developed along with a comprehensive user-friendly design manual. Analysis of parking and traffic related matters include looking at existing and proposed parking supply and demand as well as alternatives for replacement parking in the city. Fiscal impact analysis includes looking at the cost to the city as well as the business community and looking at the cost of the replacement parking alternatives as well as determining the appropriate fees for the program to be implemented. Community engagement includes two community-wide wide, um, meetings, in-depth stakeholder interviews, and three participation, three uh, up to three participations in the task force meetings itself to help facilitate um, our discussions. And lastly, environmental documentation in compliance with CEQA. The proposed work scope is anticipated to be completed in 15 months with a contract amount not to exceed $400,000. From here, I'll try to highlight some of the experiences from our consultant team that relates to our work plan effort. The first is the City of San Diego's Permanent Outdoor Dining Program in which MIG assisted with community outreach, stakeholder interviews, branding, um, spaces as places is their branding used for their outdoor dining program. And as you can see, the um, comprehensive user-friendly design manual was also developed by MIG. Currently, MIG is working with the City of Santa Barbara on the State Street Master Plan that stemmed from the temporary closure of several blocks along the historic Main Street. And as they're trying to create something permanent and revisioning, um, re envisioning their future of downtown, they are currently going through a lot of um, community outreach efforts. Next is another um, temporary COVID era program that has um, been proposed with a permanent plaza. It's in Palm Desert and it's called the Lupine Plaza that was recently completed by um, MIG. Next is the Laguna Beach Downtown Plan and Streets Closure Study. 
Um, this is this was part of their specific plan, and um, while it was pre-COVID, a lot of the temporary and permanent street closures that they studied or exploring the possibility of parklets, which are extensions of the sidewalk onto street parking lanes to create more public spaces and amenities, has been implemented during COVID. Other examples include downtown parking studies in the city of Azusa and the city of Santa Cruz, where the consultant analyzed existing parking, supply and demand, pricing, and also looked into financing strategies to create additional parking spaces. This concludes staff's presentation. I also want to note that MIG's representative, Rick Barrett, is also joining us via Zoom for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Stand by. Councilor Lesser. Uh, Senior Planner Yoon, thank you for that presentation. Just to confirm, there's a reference to MIG using subcontractors. I want to confirm that that utilization of subcontractors is included within the not to exceed 400000 Yes, that is correct. Contract. Second, is earlier during public comment, one of the members of the task force asked if there could be included in the scope of work, the Exhibit A, an express reference to impacts on residents downtown. Could that uh, language be incorporated here just as easily to include that in the scope of work? Any reason why it shouldn't? Why? We agree that it can be included to explicitly say that we will be analyzing impacts to the surrounding uses, including residential, but we believe that it is part of the scope of work under SWOT analysis, as well as the community-wide robust community um, engagement efforts that will include all stakeholders. But um, I will leave it up to the City Council to decide. Talk it with my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Napolitano. Yes. Uh Making a comment in the form of a question, <laughs> and, and that is, I really, and I, I hope MIG is listening. I, uh, I don't know, you said, mentioned the consultant who's listening. I hope he is, because what I really want to come back is a realistic, pragmatic plan that can be implemented mm -hmm. yesterday, not a 10, 20-year plan that costs millions of dollars that will never happen like our last downtown plan. Take that last plan, take all the things that nobody wanted, strip them away, and then start from there. I don't want to see a plan to come back that we're not going to do, that asks for things that nobody supports, that are a, sorry, but a planner's dream, but a fiscal manager's nightmare. It has to be doable, has to be supported, and it has to be within reason, so there should be guardrails on this effort as, as to something that can be implemented. This isn't a, a blank sheet of paper. It's not an excuse to go out and um, come up with ideas that are off the wall. I've been to Santa Barbara, I've been to Laguna. Uh, they've got lots of other access points that we don't have. All that kind of thing should be taken in consideration, so I guess my, my couched question is, are those things going to be considered as well? <laughs> we are looking at various case studies during our task force meetings, and we are going to cherry pick the ones that can be applicable or modified to fit into the character of the city. And fiscally responsible and within reason doable. Yes. I don't want a plan that, I, that we're going to save for and do 20 years from now that by the time it can be implemented is then obsolete. Understood. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm oh, sorry, Mayor Patel Franklin? Yes, thank you. Uh, th th thanks for the report. So um, initially I was a little uh, concerned because there wasn't much detail here about the company, mm -hmm. MIG. So thank you for, for including that and adding that to the report. Um, I have also been, you know, to uh, Santa Barbara and to San Diego. They have, they do have a lot more space to deal with. Yes. Um, in interviewing them, did you discuss what they have learned from our experience with, what, close to three years of outdoor dining in terms of street closures and, you know, the, uh, the restaurants that might be interested in it, uh, the kind of size of the decks. I mean, I would imagine that they probably would have studied what we did or asked you questions. Did that 
Yes, that, that is correct. They are aware that there are 26 or so sidewalk dining that is currently permitted. So they do include in their scope of work to interview those that are currently participating in the program, but also they will be looking at past data to see what has gone through in the city, what are the unintended consequences, and also any other information that they can gather from the stakeholder interviews. I, I, I'm sorry, you, you said the number 20, there are 20? I, I believe there's 26 or so sidewalk dining permits that are currently yeah. issued. But, but in terms of the decks, there was a lot more. Yes, there are decks, and we do have data on that that we will be sharing with the consultant team. Okay, so, <coughs> I mean, as part of, I mean, granted, only one responded, but uh, did they ask during the interview process with them, did they ask what we did and yes. what we've learned from that? Because that's a mm -hmm. great body of information that just it, it, it should be analyzed and not swept away I think. Yes, we have a plethora of information that we already organize within our folders that are ready to be distributed to the consultant team so they can catch up pretty quickly to what the information we already have compiled. Okay. As well as the SWOT analysis that they'll be conducting will also be assisting them along the way. Okay. And um, uh, just so the public knows, uh, I remember back when we were considering the use of consultant, there was a number of $250,000 uh, that was going to be the cost. If you could explain the 400000 please. I'll, I'll take that question. Um, we had originally anticipated that this would cost us about $500,000. Um, and what we did is we split what we were asking for the council from the council by into this fiscal year and then the upcoming fiscal year, um, and when we got the um, proposal back, it was initially around four hundred seventy four, which was very close to our anticipated five hundred thousand amount, and we spent quite a bit of time and credit to Jay He, um, she worked um, very hard with the consultant to fine tune that proposal to pull that back to $400,000. There were a lot of things that we said we can take on as staff, we have the ability to do that in house. And so there are certain things we took out. Um, and so we started with 474, we came down to 400. We did believe initially that it was gonna cost the city about $500,000 with all of the things we were seeking from a consultant. Um, but we did split that money into this current fiscal year and the future fiscal year. Okay. And then, as, as long as you're there, uh, could we um, uh, just discuss uh, the the earlier plan, the downtown specific plan, what ended up being the boogeyman in the whole thing was the Coastal Commission. So Correct. I didn't see much talked about in the Coastal Commission here and their experience in dealing with them. So. Can you give us some? Absolutely. So we do have, uh, we are the in-house experts on the Coastal Commission, and uh, we are already doing our part to meet with them regularly, understand what their needs are, and then relay that information to the task force as well as the consultant in terms of what their expectations are going to be and we ha what we have to do to be able to gain their blessing. Um, and so we have the in-house expertise to deal with the Coastal Commission as planners, um, and we will continue to do that um, as we move forward with the process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. No more questions. Thank you. Councilmember Lesser. I wanted to follow up on Councilmember Napolitano's question, perhaps to the director, and that is to the extent that some of us up here have participated in some prior studies, be it the downtown plan, facility strategic plan, and seen other great efforts to try and tackle some of these long-term planning issues. What do you think we can do to ensure that this is a plan, that when we're done with it, really can be implemented, implemented quickly? You've already referenced the Coastal Commission. That's terrific. But what are some of the practical steps to ensure we don't get ahead of us ourselves and dream big things that perhaps we really can't afford to do? I think that, um, uh, thank you for the question. So one of the things that we've already started doing is analyzing what's worked and what hasn't worked um, in the two other cities that do have the Coastal Commission's blessing, uh, one being San Diego, the other one being Capitola in Northern California. Um, and the Coastal Commission has already gone through the process with them and said, well, we want, you know, we want this extra thing from you in order to be able to grant you. And we've watched all of those discussions happen with those two jurisdictions and the Coastal Commission, and we already understand um, what it is that they're going to be looking for. So we're we're working on we're working on how we're going to develop our program to have proactively addressed some of their concerns <clears throat> that were raised kind of later in the game with these two other jurisdictions. 
Um, so that I think and our uh, co current cooperation with the Coastal Commission staff. I will also add that we're not unique, right, This um, in, in wanting this particular program very quickly. From what we're hearing from the Coastal Commission is that all of the cities are working really hard to get something up and running and to get their the Coastal Commission's blessing on a program so that they can all bring the outdoor dining back. Um, and it's not it's not one jurisdiction asking some for something out of the ordinary. So they are also understanding the urgency um, of these requests coming from the city, and they're learning from each and every application that's coming forward, and every, each and every city, and they are and they are providing us direction based on all of their experiences along the way. And so that's going to be really helpful to us, knowing that they've already expressed that in general the Coastal Commission has seen the advantage of it, and and they're working with us, not against us, to try to get this done. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Senator mm -hmm. since you're there, I'll, I'll wrap up here before we go to public comment. So all of us will go to Palm Springs and Santa Barbara and San Diego. I've been in San Diego every two weeks. I'm just curious. MIG is based in Los Angeles? They're a national firm, so they're everywhere, including Los Angeles. The nearest office to us is Los Angeles. Uh, I'm not sure. Give or take. San Diego. So somewhat close to Los Angeles. All right. How many meetings have you had, a staff meetings you've had, the volunteer board meetings? The task Allen? force meetings? That would be two. Two so far. Two in May. And only a question I had on surprise, two attorneys on this council, we didn't, they didn't grab it. On page two of staff report, page 542, it says the last line. We're talking about the timeline. Complete the project in a timely manner, which is expected, my favorite word, take approximately 15 months. That's one. But if you go to their contract, Quinn's probably reading behind me, page 545, item 1C, time performance, deadline established by the city representative, or if no deadline is established with reasonable diligence. My fear, as Steve brought up, this becomes a long rolling process well, all of a sudden 15 months is 24 months and then 28 months and 36 months so i'm asking how my colleagues agree that we look at a definite hard stop here not a rolling wheel that they can be arbitrary when it's going to end that'll be discussed later but i want to make sure that you guys do the same thing i'm concerned about understood thank you no other comments council nothing else thank you we'll take public comments now on this item yes ladies come on down Good evening, Mayor Montgomery, Council Members, and Carol Perrin. Um, I want to specifically talk about the contracts. It's, that's what's uh, on the agenda tonight. And I read the contract carefully, and as many of you know, I do contracts all day long. <laughs> and so I read the contract, and I, my purpose of being here is really to urge this council, and I hope unanimously, to make some modifications to this contract before um, it is approved. First of all, you know, the way the contract's written, it says that the, uh, that the consultant has to do the scope of work. And the scope of work is identified on Exhibit A. And then in, in Section 3C, it says every, anything that you ask them to do otherwise that's not identified in the scope of work is additional fee. And none of what we heard tonight almost is identified in Exhibit a, which is the scope of work. The one I'm most concerned about is uh, having nothing in here that when we're looking at trying to put together a plan that really will work for everybody, there's nothing in the scope of work that talks about the potential direct or indirect um, impacts to existing residential use. And I think that's imperative. I know that city staff said it was implicit, but the only thing that the contract says is that they'd be engaging with the public, and we heard tonight there would be two public meetings. That is not in any way looking at the impacts to the existing residential use, which is really necessary to make sure we have a workable plan. The second thing that I want to talk about was Steve's point about fiscal. We said that they were going to look at the cost. It's not in the scope of work. I, I've got to stop because I could I go further, but it's not in here, so thank you. Thank you, Carol. Appreciate your volunteer review. Okay. Counselor. 
Good evening, everybody, Mayor, Pro Tem, everybody that I know here, and, and city staff. And I just want to thank Taylor and Jay Lee for, for um, handling all this, because I know it's a big job. And, uh, and they've come into a community that's already got a lot of issues with all this going on in many years of dealing with it. Um, I'm also concerned about the fact there's nothing about the residents. Uh, talking about community engagement as a piece with two meetings. We have to engage the downtown residents. Um, we all live with each other. I mean, I'm, I, I'm a next door, so I'm reading things, and it's like, oh, I love third floor. Let's open up third floor. But they don't know the impact of sound on residents. So they don't have that consideration. And I'm concerned somebody coming in the door here as a consultant might not recognize that either or hear those thoughts. And um, so I don't know what's being prepared for them. Also, I just want to talk about our sidewalk encroachments. Because I live on 10th and Manhattan Avenue, all I see are people sitting on the encroachments, eating paradise, having Becker's sandwiches, sitting, hanging out with their kids, with their dogs all day long and across the street. Um, and I'm concerned because there's, I thought those public encroachments were for public use on those corners. And there is um, uncorked, which is like using it as a store, permanent storage area outdoor, which is not pretty to look at. And it's not of any use to the public. But I did speak to Eric, and he thought that it wasn't an issue because it wasn't implicit in the laws that we, the ordinance that we signed a long time ago about those public use. Whereas Aviator Nation is doing this beautiful job putting in flowers, and people can sit there and, and enjoy it. So I want to make sure the public is thought about, too. And it's not just about business and um, people making money on these parklets. So I spoke to Council Member Napolitano about having some space for the public. Because that's who we really care about here, and I think that's who the Coastal Commission cares about also. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Good evening, Mayor Montgomery and Council. Um, I did attend the, the second dining committee meeting, and um, one of the things I would like is for us to take a look backward as well as project forward. And so I would like to remind you of all the complaints that we heard before COVID about um, servers parking in adjacent residential neighborhoods. Um, you know, do we want, I am concerned about infrastructure and capacity issues. Do we have enough areas for all of the garbage that attracted our coyotes to be stored? Do we have, um, what about the large trucks? This is an opportunity to um, find ways to have smaller trucks come into our community and address the, I want the organization to look back and, and look at all those complaints and address those. Then look forward and um, look at Uber use and Lyft use um, and plan accordingly and all the new um, electric bikes as well as our COVID dogs, which take extra sidewalk space. Finally, I'd like to um, suggest a book for for you all to read, it's called Paved Paradise. And it's by Henry G-R-A-B-E-R-B-A-R. -E I'm sure you can find it. And it's all about parking. Steve, are you, you're nodding in a way that I, are you familiar with this book? What's that? Are you familiar with the book? I am, yeah, very familiar with it. Great, thank you. <laughs> can I borrow? Read all about it. Kathy, thank you, thank you. With an homage to Joni Mitchell there. Appreciate yeah, exactly. That. <laughs> Thank you. Any other public comment on Zoom, anybody? No Zoom. We'll close public comment and go to Councilmember Howarth, then Councilmember Napolitano. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. A few, I've got a few, not random, but maybe disparate comments. Um, one, I, so I, I so appreciate like the comments Kathy just had and Carol and Suzanne. And um, one thing, uh, you know, we want any consultant that we're going to have um, do the community engagement that was mentioned. But we also, I believe there's still an email that 
if you go to the page on outdoor dining, um, that you can send in your comments and ideas. And, and of course, and I think, Carol, you're on the task force or an alternate. I mean, I do, because I, I do want to capture, I'm oh, sorry, you guys look like you want to say something to, okay, we're, sorry. We're not ready. Okay. We're not ready. We're not ready yet. Okay, hold on. Just hold on. Cool. I don't know. There seems like there's something going on, but I don't know. Set up in case you have okay. a question. Okay, no, that's okay. Thanks. <laughs> be comfortable. I'm just chitty chatty. No, um, I want to be sure those, those comments are captured because, you know, you mentioned them here in a council meeting, and we all hear them, but let's make sure they're captured, right? And... Um, you know those comments right so it, that's number one and carol you did mention something like two meetings are not enough and i think she was talking about there had been two meetings already of the task force no okay i'm wrong thank you we're consultants what's that we're two consultants, consultants say two you're right that's not quite enough um and i'm fine with uh putting in implicit ex Im explicitly you know con concerns for impacts to residents um, so just want to kind of tie in all those, but I, what I want to say is that it's interesting, you know, we all like to talk about the former downtown specific plan we did and the, the urban land Institute exercise that we did. Now, what I want to say folks, though, is there are some good pieces to that. And there's been a lot of work done in that. And I would hope, I'm sure the consultants will um, take a look at that because that goes to uh, your comment, Steve, about throw out the bad parts, but look at good parts that were already done because there, have, there has been some work done. They can find them. If they can find them. I actually have been looking through it. But anyway, we need um, this consultants or these consultants because uh, a task force can't do it on its own. The, the staff can't do it on its own, although I really appreciate um, Jihei's, you know, pencil sharpening, if you will, to try to knock down some price and figure out what staff can do. That is really appreciated. This is such a complicated, complex task with so many facets, whether it's legal and regulatory versus traffic, right? You know, whether some streets could, are going to be shut, you know, one way or how parking is going to be handled. So I, I have high hopes. Um, I'm also someone who's pretty optimistic, so I believe this will add value. But I just, it's a, it's a big number, but this is a big thing that we want to figure out how to do right. So I will be supporting this with um, the caveat that I would like to put in uh, the residential impacts to local downtown residents considered into the language. So uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Councilor Politano. Thank you, Your Honor. And I guess go back to the budget discussion earlier, right? And we've added positions over the years, and sometimes we get dinged by folks. How can we have more people for the city? That city hasn't grown in size. It hasn't uh, grown in, in population. Um, but the demands are much higher than we've ever had before. The requirements, the mandates that we have to deal with are much higher. This is another instance where, frankly, I'm – you know, I, I'm no fan of consultants, and I have no problem saying that. And frankly, we could take this on ourselves if we had the staff who can do that. You hire consultants to make up for the lack of staff that you had and the lack of expertise, although I believe we have that expertise on staff. Having said that, though, this needs management. And while staff is going to manage the consultants, we also need to manage this process as council. And I want frequent reports back to council is my request to have frequent reports back to council because i don't want the task force to get ahead of mm -hmm. council i don't want the consultant to get ahead of council as the city manager pays attention to this and that we need to be the backstop here because i do want council to be the guardrails in, in terms of what's realistic and what's not because while there are i'm sure if someone will point them out to me, good parts about that previous study that was is collecting dust on a shelf somewhere, that the reality is, though, they came up with a $25 million uh, bike path bypass plan. They came up with yep. 
adding more stories to the buildings downtown. They came up with a lot of things that might work in other cities, maybe Chicago where they were from, but don't work here in Manhattan Beach. And that's why I still believe our expertise is ourselves. It's not going to be the consultant. The consultant is there for my purposes to inform and to guide, but to not certainly not decide, but give us options. Yep. We're going to have to make these decisions over time. I don't want to report at the end that is a disappointment to everyone, and council says, what were you thinking? We need to be part of this process, too. Now, I read, and to the mayor's point earlier, um, you know, as far as the term, I, I read the term of agreement as this, uh, where it says on page four, 546 that it ends on December 31st, 2024. I hope it's sooner than that. Um, <laughs> you know, and I hope that the incorporation of the talking to the um, downtown residents is part of the discussion of the stakeholders, which is already incorporated there. Uh, in addition to the two public, the, the two public isn't just for the downtown residents, it's for everybody across the city. So, uh, you know, and this is one of those things where, uh, you know, I also hesitate to kind of put a, a hard stop or anything because if we want an additional meeting, we're going to have to pay for it. If we want additional public meeting, if we want additional stakeholder meeting, we're going to have to pay for it. So we know that going in. I think we have the, what we're, we're paying for, we're, what we're signing up for now, and then we decide later whether or not we need additional uh, information. Uh, a lot of things have already been said. A lot of things should be incorporated by the task force. A lot of things can be addressed, again, by council informing this process as well along the way. But it's going to take all of us. It can't be you guys go do your thing, come back to council 15 months from now, and we say, eh, maybe, no, yes. We have to be part of it all the way along. And whether the task force likes that or not, that's our job, too. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, so, Councilman Lesser? I agree with the substantive comments of my two colleagues, but I just had a process question, and that is to the extent that we're proposing an amendment to the scope of work, is that something you normally need to check with the consultant first in terms of ensuring that the scope of work is going to be accepted by the consultant if we're going to be modifying it here with an amendment, for example, with regard to studying residential impacts and perhaps some other modifications as well? We do have the consultant on board, so if the council would like, if, um, no, would you like us to check offline? Um, I don't, they would not, I, I don't believe there would be an issue because the, uh, the stakeholder interviews that are already incorporated, the involvement in our task force meetings, which do include residents as well as business owners, as well as the community meetings are intended specifically to engage all stakeholders, including residents, businesses, the public, et cetera. Okay. Well, I wanted to make sure at a minimum the, the language that was proposed by the speaker, Ms. Perrin, as well as Mr. Burton earlier, is included the potential impacts on residential use. I also very much concur with council member on residents. Thank you. With regard to reporting back to council, you've been terrific in providing me with information about what the task force conversations have been about, what the agenda is going forward, but I think the community would benefit with this council overseeing this process to ensure that we don't end up with something on the other side that we just can't implement. So, thank you. Absolutely. Where you go, I want to come. Every time, Franklin, you first time you're speaking, I'll let you go first. No, yeah. okay. After. No, ladies first. Go ahead. No, no, or no. Ladies second. No, come on now. Let's okay. So, um, uh, you know, we've all taken a good long look at outdoor dining. Uh, we kind of got some concepts. We, you know, that's why I asked that question earlier. Did, did they ask, like, what did we do and what have you found? I think we could agree that the street closure at Manhattan Avenue, while a good attempt, you know, it just didn't work, you know. And, and, and we, were in a, we were in a COVID, you know, environment and it was an emergency. So um, uh, I'm also concerned about the, you know, how long this seems to take. I mean, basically what we're looking at is we're looking at However, to extend it is just, not just, but there are going to be uh, areas, I'm not even going to call them decks, but areas that are going to extend from the sidewalk or be incorporated with the sidewalk in front of restaurants that want to have them. Um, not landscaping, you know, not redoing landscaping, not redoing the, you know, the overall design and flow of this, uh, you know, of the city. It's, it, it's, we, we have so little to work with. You know, as I said before, we're not blessed with the big, you know, um, 
you know, like in Hermosa Beach, you know, a, a big, what do you want to call it? Thoroughfare. A, yeah, thoroughfare, you know, to close and then go ahead and mark off for out, outdoor dining. So I see the, the, the scope is being rather limited. You know, it, it should be limited to those factors. And to see this going on for 15 months, when it seems like, you know, as you said, with the Coastal Commission, you're the resident experts on dealing with the Coastal Commission, and wisely we're going to have them, uh, well, they're the, you know, they're the gating factor, if you will, uh, in, in anything here. So we can only go as far as, uh, as they're going to let us, is I just think that um, the scope just needs to be really fine-tuned, especially for the tune of $400,000. And, and the time and how everybody wants it and how it's so, you know, it was so popular. And if it, and we need to know if it's going to work or not. So I, I just think we could go ahead and just define this scope of work a little bit more finer uh, to, to just really accomplish what we want to do, which is what, what's it going to look like? How far is it going to go in? Can we capture parking that we didn't capture before? And, uh, and, and, and have the flow through, through downtown and the impact on residents and have them have a say and see if it's too much, too little. Um, but I think it can, you know, it's almost like the Marshall Plan, right? Here we're celebrating, you know, the memory of D-Day and, uh, you know, the Marshall Plan rebuilt Europe in almost this amount of time. <laughs> we're just talking about Manhattan Beach, so that's what I'd like to see. Thank you. Councilmember Howarth? Yeah, there wasn't the internet back then and next door, so it was a lot easier to do things. But um, All right, so I, I'm going to make a motion. Um, and I wanted to, uh, which will be to, to adopt this resolution with some of the things that we've talked about. I, I really think Councilmember Napolitano put his, uh, hit the nail on the head that we have to direct the process, and I think not just with the consultants, but even with the task force, because this is where, this is why reports end up on a shelf. It's not necessarily because of the consultant, right? It's because the right people weren't driving it or consulted in time. And um, so we really, you know, we owe it, if we're going to allocate this money, if we decide to do that, if we're going to do this, we have to, you know, take res not just responsibility, all of us always take responsibility, but we represent the community, you know, and we can say, yeah, not three stories downtown, you know, all those things that came to us. So I, I really, I don't want this to just be an empty, yeah, well, we got to control the process. Like how, we, you know, let's find out how we're going to, show us how we're going to do that. Is it going to be every two months? Is it going to be after every you know, meeting, is it gonna be, here's what they're thinking. So I think that's really, really crucial. I go back to my, what I said originally, and then I think this is, uh, in the 15 months, I, I know it does, it's a long time, but there's, there is a lot to consider. You do have to do traffic studies and parking studies, and these things aren't just you go out one weekend and you say this and that, and maybe you're not gonna close off Manhattan Avenue, but maybe you're gonna, change things and make it one direction or you know one way or this way to give more rooms to you know build the deck it, you you need to exp i don't think we're deciding now that well we're just going to put up the decks in front of some of the restaurants again and extend the sidewalk we don't know that's what we're doing we don't know exactly what we're doing yet we don't know if we're removing parking meters and doing kiosks we don't know we don't know what we're doing yet um we want to try and, and I, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice if we just throw up the decks again, right? That's so. Um, so that's why I'll be supporting uh, this um, and uh, asking staff to explicitly add impacts to downtown residents or name, you know, residents who will be affected by this, whether it's parking, trash, et cetera. Um, uh, 15 months uh, and not to exceed $400,000. So I would move to adopt resolution 23-0072 with those two caveats. All right, I'll wrap up here for everybody here. Uh, Director Mayor's County, here's a few things, questions for you. 
How many downtown residents, including alternates, do we have currently in the task force? Do we know? All primary members have been present for the past two meetings. Um, at the first meeting, we had several alternates also participating. I don't have a number. I think it was maybe four or five alternates. And for the second meeting, I believe we had two or three alternates participating. Okay. How many are residents? So, residents are roughly 10. 10. Yes. All right. So downtown, downtown has residents attending the meeting. Is that correct? Yes. Both the meetings we have, all two of them so far. All right. No questions for you all. I'll finish my comments now. Um, to the earlier comment, and Maltana is correct, the world has changed in 2020. Nothing is the same that we had. The report that may not or may have been good back in 2019, doesn't matter. Whatever year it was, we're not doing that. We're not going backwards anymore. Everything has changed since then. Whatever good ideas may or may not have been there, gone. Doesn't make a difference anymore. Everything's changed. So from that perspective, looking forward with it, I agree we need somebody from the outside to do it. As Steve mentioned, we don't have the staff time expertise to do that. That's why we're going outside in the first place. If we had someone, if you had 10 more of you, we could do it. We don't have 10 more of you. So we have to go outside to find people that can do it with the comments that were made by Councilor Howarth. Everybody here agrees it needs to be that. If you can add in later scope of services that add in impact, not just the downtown residents, but if you get north end residents are affected too. And everybody else on the east side, if you're going to put things in aviation, are affected as well. So it isn't just downtown we're talking about. So everybody that's affected should be included in scope A of services. The cost part of it, too, and, and Steve, when I mentioned this, Steve, it wasn't that on page 542 uh, or page 2 staff report. I'm not worried about the extra meetings that are coming to council after they finish the report. Just I'm looking for a hard stop to finish the report. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen. I'll say it or now. 15 months become 24 months, and we're going to look at each other and go, what the hell happened? We need a hard stop to finish the report, and then whatever extra time, December 31st, that is our time to say, hey, look, good report, great report. Here's our fine-tuned adjustments when we go forward. That's what I thought it meant. So that open-ended part between 15 months and December 31st, 24, that is our time to fine-tune it, whatever the report says. But if you don't put a hard stop on it, I guarantee everyone here, I'll take that bet, it will be in 15 months, it will become 24 months. That's my only concern with it. Other comments that have been made, I totally agree with. And we have a very, if you don't live here very long, you'll understand it, a high-touch community between the city and the residents. We all get emails, all of them emails. And so we can see. And the reason why we add staff, not just public safety, is that we need someone else to handle these issues that pop up that we didn't see coming or we need more hands to help us with. That's why we're here today. We need this to get it going. And the longer we fine-tune it, fine -tune it or tweak it, it'll be 18 months down the road before we get anything done. So I, I agree with Councilor Howarth that we need to get something started. I trust you and the city manager and city attorney to fine-tweak that language so that we're all comfortable with it going forward. Everyone's needs have been addressed. You've heard our comments. We go from there. Thank you. you want to add any closing comments to that? No, oh, thank you. Right. <laughs> city Attorney Barrow. There was a motion. Was there a second? Yes. Yep. I have a motion by Councilor Howard with all the comments made by all five council members. A second by Council Member Lesser. No further comments? Yes, but so I just want to make it just to clarify. So if you go to the scope of services. Yes. See, these concerns were implicit in the scope of services, but we can make it explicit. Yes. So if you go to Exhibit A. Okay. Where it Page says, 560 of the staff report. Yes, page 560. Yes, in the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, looks like the eighth line where it begins, it's expected to actively engage with the public. We can add language, including residents, to make it specific. They are members of the public, but this will be precise, more precise. With respect to the exploring impacts on residents, that was also implicit in the CEQA review, but we can make it explicit. We'll add a sentence or, or, or a phrase, um, essentially explore the impacts on residents. So I think that covers that part of the motion. 
All right, Councilor Howarth. Yeah, I. As Anything long as more? you add no, as long as you add that second piece, because engaging with the public and residents is not enough. So I, it has to include that other piece. Both changes, yes. Okay. Let me ask my colleague the second piece. How does anybody feel about having a project completion date of nine six September six, not the contract end date? Project completion date fifteen months from today puts it at nine six. That's our hard stop date to bring the project report to us, not other discussions, just project completion date. Anybody have a problem with that? What I'd like to do, with your permission, yes. would be to ask staff whether that's realizable given the other work demands of that department. Obviously, we can direct that, but I just want to make sure that's achievable. I'm already reading what's in the report. 15 months, 15 months, right? It's their words, not mine. <laughs> you put it out there. I'll only point out, Your Honor, that the end date here is beyond yeah. our service on yeah. the council. And so September, it depends on how much you want to have this as a parting Please. vote or a vote for the new council. Yes. I'm oh, sorry. I'd like you guys to be part of it. Your comments were about the 15 months? Um, just that, I mean, we don't want to speak on behalf of oh, the no, just, is of it the reasonable consultant. that your 15 months is reasonable 15 months for a project completion date, 15 months? That, that is what we had aimed for. Okay. Thank you. So it locks down the 9-6 date. Anyway, problem with that? No. So that was so, part two. There we go. That's a, you amended that comments to include 9-6 as a project completion date? Right. All right. And then we, part three on the 400000 maximum um, compensation and this was identified by um, one of the speakers. <clears throat> On 3C, there's additional services. We're going to yes. uh, make it clear in the agreement that only the city council can authorize anything over $400,000. Agreed. Okay, so those are the three changes to the contract. And um, so I, that's clear to all of us. All right. And if there's a if the consultant has a problem with that deadline nine six, he'll let us know. Well said. So that's the motion. Okay. Perfect. As as noted by Councilmember Howard, you good with that? Yep. Then voting screen, please. And I accept two. <laughs> <laughs> motion passes five zero. Good. Thank you, ladies, for being here. I appreciate your time. <laughs> All right, next item up is the consideration of a three-year memorandum understanding with Oceanographic Teaching Services, OTS, authorizing the use of the roundhouse for fundraising events and consideration of requests from the OTS to modify permissible hours in the existing agreement to allow for an earlier start time for a June 7, 23 event led by Parks and Rec Director Mark Lehman. Director Lehman, the floor is yours. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Linda Robb, our Senior Management Analyst, will be presenting this item for you. Thank you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, the item before you tonight uh, is a three-year MOU with the Oceanographic Teaching Stations um, that runs the Roundhouse. Um, this MOU would allow small fundraising events at the Roundhouse to fund educational programs. 15% of the revenue of these events is paid to the city into the state pier and parking lot fund. Um, this agreement originally came to city council in June of 2020 and ran um, as a six month pilot program. Um, unfortunately, that was during COVID times and the pilot was delayed and began in September 2021, running through March 2022. Due to the short time period and small number of events, a one-year agreement to extend the pilot program was approved by City Council last year on June 21st. Um, so it does expire on June 20th, which is why we're here today. Um, the agreement that you have in your packet is uh, largely unchanged, except to remove the reference to the pilot program and to change the term to three years um, and adding some additional language allowing for consideration of events that fall outside of the standard event hours that were originally agreed upon. 
Uh, the language proposed would allow the city manager or city manager's designee to consider events outside of the stated times for approval. Staff has received a rental request and is seeking direction for an event on June 7th, tomorrow, uh, to occur from 5 to 8 p.m., which is two hours earlier than is permitted in the current agreement um, to compensate for the early closing of the roundhouse OTS has proposed to open an hour earlier to provide additional public access to the facility um, this is very short in conclusion <laughs> staff recommends that City Council discuss and provide direction on the memorandum of understanding and if approved adopt resolution 23-0070 um, as well as provide direction on the rental request submitted for June 7th I'm available for questions I do believe that Grace Adams from uh, OTS is on the zoom call all right thank you Councilman Palatano yeah I thought when we received an email about this that the for as far as the event tomorrow goes that the roundhouse was going to be open three hours earlier than uh, to offset the the loss of time but regardless of what it is I guess it's 10 a.m. it's one hour earlier but I mean how would the public know except those just walking on this pier that you know hey we're gonna have an event it's gonna close early but you can come earlier during the day so the OTS does update their hours on their website um, it appears daily I, I see that today they um, they did list that they were closed for maintenance um, and that they have some adjusted hours there so the information would be available on their website I believe they also post their hours outside and regarding the the the, the 10 o'clock the 10 a.m. the roundhouse is actually open for field trips um, from 10 a.m. up until 1 at 1 p.m. they they provide two sessions for field trips like 10 to 11 30 11 30 to 1 o'clock and then they normally close from 1 to 2 and open to the public at 2 o'clock but they would be just staying open after those two field trips that are scheduled tomorrow I think they also announced the earlier opening time on a tweet I saw earlier today. So they're using social media to announce that. Did they have a blue check? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Lesser? I wanted to better understand the basis for requesting an exchange of the hours and the discretion of the city manager as opposed to allowing the council to simply set some broader time parameters for a certain number of days to the extent there's a request for special events. So tomorrow's event would begin at 5 o'clock, which is before it ordinarily would close to the public by right. two hours you indicated. Right. Is this what the OTS is seeking, essentially? Is they, are they seeking a certain number of opportunities to open, excuse me, to close earlier so they can have a private event as opposed to leaving this to the discretion of the city manager so I don't want to speak for OTS however I believe in practice um, in the beginning when we established this agreement there were set hours they are open till 7 p.m. to the public and the when they were envisioning the types of events that would be held there um, probably a different type of event was envisioned a, co a cocktail party a reception a wedding so something like that on a very small scale um, that would happen in the evenings after closing um, in practice that hasn't come to fruition resulting in the low right. uh, number of events that are requested um, because it looks like there might be a different sort of niche maybe with corporate events or, or something like that that might happen earlier um, I would invite um, Grace to participate if she um, feels that I'm mischaracterizing to the mayor, this, may I at least ask what mm -hmm. the request is by OTS if sure, there's a concern not? about giving broad discretion and nailing down what the intent is here so uh, you want to know what the specific event is? No, intent. Oh. oh. Is uh, it indeed to have just two additional hours earlier, for example? So for this particular event, yes. Um, but to leave the option open in the future to at least examine um, other events as they come in um, on a case-by-case -case basis. 
if the city council is uncomfortable with leaving that to the city, you know, to staff's discretion, um, we'd be happy to bring these events to council. Or if you were to suggest changing the hours, um, we could do that too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Member Tim Franklin. Yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I just want to confirm uh, on item <coughs> F of the uh, MOU, maximum occupancy for events, it says that it's 40. Mm -hmm. Now, we, uh, there was also a discussion about staff and caterers and security and the like. Uh, is the 40 everybody or is the 40 apply to guests? So the 40 does apply to guests. The fire department has set a maximum occupancy for the facility at 49. Um, so the 40 is for guests and then any additional staff if there were to be Staff required that is over nine then they would reduce the number of the guests. Okay, and so um, This applies only to the inside of the roundhouse is that correct correct furniture can't be set up on the outside They can't rope off they are not allowed Thanks. to set up pop-up tents or do any cooking outside. Um, not um, allowed to restrict any public access to the pier. Okay, and, and just out of curiosity, uh, I mean, we had uh, an MOU in place. How did this um, event that's that's going to happen tomorrow? How did it? I, I mean, we had established what the parameters were. How did it come to be where it needs two hours earlier? And, uh, well, uh, OTS would like to host an event in order to um, raise some funds for educational programming. The request that they received did not fall within the parameters and based on the small number of event requests that they've received that actually do fall within the parameters, they, are they made the request. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, So the, uh, the, the, the same question I have, or a similar question to what Council Member Lesser had, was about um, item uh, B, 3BE, about the city manager or the city manager's designee, you know, at the, at the discretion of the city manager or the city manager's desig designee, uh, events falling outside of those time periods may be approved. Um, I'm not sure um, how, how my, my colleagues feel about that, but it, it just seems that this MOU is going to be in place. It's going to be very specific. Everybody knows what it's going to be. Why is there a need to have a, you know, an exception in there? Um, maybe, maybe that's just a rhetorical question. Rhetorical. I, I, yeah. I don't know, but... Um, uh, that was added, obviously, because there was a feeling that there sh should be some discretion from a, that's decided upon by a city manager. No, we don't we want can to, make this really easy and tell you, I don't want the discretion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would prefer that the hours are stated in the, in the agreement and there's, there's no ambiguity or ability to change it. So the city manager is not in favor of giving me that authority. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. so, okay. Um, I think... Oh, um, do, so the city's going to get, uh, according to uh, the revenue contribution to the Peer Improvement Fund, 15% of the aggregate amount of all the license fees uh, that are received by OTS. Uh, is there a need, do you think, for council or for the city manager to see what, those, to see what you're charging? I mean, is there a set price list? Is um, there so I did reach out to OTS to see if they um, have a set uh, pricing structure that they use. I was able to communicate with Grace Adams from OTS. Um, they do have an hourly rental structure. Um, it originally started much higher, ha has been reduced, and then they found a need. It was originally like a four-hour structure um, for a set amount, but it has been broken down into an hourly structure now that I do have, and if you'd like, I can read it or I can forward it on to you. No, I just want to make sure that it that exists and that it does exist. And that the city, Correct. someone at the city is taking a look at that. Okay. Um, that's it. Thank you so much.
Councilman Palatano. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, frankly, yeah, this thing, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me at all. Um, the hours that are listed uh, in the wintertime, right, uh, 6 to 10.30, and then in the summertime, 7 to 10.30, and if we approve this, the first event they're going to have is an exception to that. Right. And then they want to be able to hit up the city manager for future exceptions. Look, special events, they're, they're trying to make money for themselves, fine. If we're in agreement with that, then just give them the hours to do that. Yeah. Just start at 5, winter or summer. Let them do that because, I mean, 7 o'clock, if you have that, if the public has access to it until 7 during the summer, then that takes, I don't know how long, but it takes time to set up events, okay? So they can't necessarily do that. So that means the event is happening at 7.30 or 8 rather than at 7. So I'm fine with starting events at 5, and maybe if anything, and I, I, I don't know what the urgency is, this, I'm fine with approving the one for tomorrow evening, but I would go back to the drawing board with OTS, see if they're in agreement with that 5 p.m., and then if we want to, if we're concerned about the number of events, then put a cap per month on events. And then if they want to exceed that cap, they have to come back to council for that. And I don't know what that number is. It's five, it's six, it's four. But have that come back to council if it exceeds a certain number. And they can project. If they're coming in, if they with requests all the time, then we can look at it again. If they're not coming in with requests all the time, then the four or five a month is fine, and, and they don't need to go outside of that. But let them start at five, and if we want to set a cap, because, I mean, we are, we are just as they are, interested in, in maintaining access to the public, and that's what our role is, maintaining access to the public out there, and we approved all this so that people could go out and enjoy it. But it also takes money to keep it going, and I get that too. And so a few extra hours set aside for fundraising, I'm good with. I know we haven't taken public comment yet, but really I'm fine with starting at five, summer or winter. And um, if we need to put a cap on anything, put a cap on the number per month, and then we can talk about it later. Thank you. Councilmember Howarth. Uh, yes, Your Honor, and I would also, if, um, again, we haven't heard from pu the public, um, uh, if, if we ask for this to come back, you know, and, and with the hours of, you know, 5 p.m., could we also add into the report and or the contract what they will be charging? Because I think it's kind of interesting, like, that should be in here, you know, what they're charging hourly or if it's a four-hour block or two-hour minimum. I, I think that needs to be in our report and contract. Okay. Mayor Pro Tim Franklin. Yes, sir. I, I had a couple of the questions, please. Um, I understand about furniture, and that includes like extra seats that might be out. And they can't be out on the pier. But how about things like lights, even though they're gonna, it's going to be within the aquarium, lights uh, and amplified sound uh, and decorations? Uh, I mean, if it's somebody's birthday party, are they going to have a you know, balloons tied to the, you know, to the railings, you know, all the way up there. Uh, I assume that would not be allowed, but I'd like to kind of nail that down. Our new railings, you mean? The, the, the soon-to-be no new railings. <laughs> no balloons, man. Well, they could be my, they could be the latex, but, you know, balloons. Uh, but uh, amplified sound, particularly, I can just hear the first, you know, party, and there's loud music coming from inside the aquarium. Uh, and also lights, you know, a light display or something inside the aquarium. I mean, is that going to be forbidden? Uh, there is no, um, there's nothing in the agreement that forbids anyone from placing light displays within the aquarium um, or using balloons besides mylar <laughs> in right. the aquarium. Uh, there is something that says that nothing may be attached or taped to walls. Um, Inside or out? It, it, it doesn't specify, so we'd be happy to clarify that um, or any other language that is um, vague, including the occupancy um, numbers. Um, well, they're so responsible for the inside, so if they ruin something inside, that's on them. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. As far as amplified sound, they would need to do uh, an amplified sound permit through the police department, just like everyone else. <laughs> Hold on. Are you good? 
Y yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else? I'll wrap up here. Uh, one, I've been to events there at the con. I've never seen anything outside of the roundhouse yet. No balloons, no lights, no cameras, no red carpet. And I can't imagine anything inside the ground house would reach the nearest resident, which is what, half a mile away? Unless you're sleeping next to the aquarium at nighttime. But other than that, I don't, I don't see an issue with it. There's a sound use permit. You have to go thank everybody else. I mean, they're trying to stay alive, folks, past so, COVID. Yeah. Wait, let me finish. It's only alive past COVID. And I agree with Steve. They want to put a cap on it, fine. Two a month. I've never seen two a month happen since the roundhouse was, was redone to have more than two events a month. If they go past that number, they're doing great. That means they're getting money right now to help them pay out their expenses. Good for them. But you know what? It hasn't happened in history. So am I worried about it happening? No. Should we have a common in place standard? Yes. I agree with Councilor Howarth about you want to see the fees? Fine. Let's see what they are. Again, we don't want to overkill it. In fact, folks, we spent more time talking about the OTS than we did our budget. <laughs> and the California went, $95 million budget, two minutes. CIP, three and a half minutes. We spent longer talking about OPS, OTS fundraiser than our own than our budget. That's embarrassing. It goes back to our high touch community that we have. We're more concerned about this than we on our own budget. So to me, I'm fine with both comments. This should be a simple agreement. I take the pressure off our city manager. Anything past the two meetings a month, a month they come back to council. If they want special timing, come back to council. If they want to put balloons, you know, cannons, whatever they want to put out there comes back to council. Cannons. Past that point, no. Make it simple. Don't over don't overthink it. No overthinking required. Just simple, clean, keep the city manager out of it, and we'll go from there. As you said, so, Your Honor, we did have five meetings on the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I <was just> gonna <laughs> say. And Mr. Mayor, I presume we should have public comment. No, no, we're going to have that next, but I want to make sure everybody hears it. Yeah. Don't need to overkill it here. So public comment, please. Who here Cannon. wants to talk about OTS longer than our budget? Anyone? <laughs> you put it that way. Seeing none. Anybody on Zoom want to talk about this longer than our budget? <laughs> no public comment. I'm shocked. We'll close public comment. Council, who'd like to talk about OTS? Well, yes, Council Montano and your... Your, I, I would make the motion. I mean, I, I'm fine with them going back and talking to OTS uh, about the long term. In the short term, I'm fine with approving uh, the event for tomorrow night, starting at 5, going to 8. Um, I'm also fine with them as direction to staff. Uh, starting at five for special events, winter or summer, and that we can cap it at two or three per month. Sure. You know, if they let's be aspirational and say three per month, if they get that many, and anything exceeding three per month, they have to get council approval for. So I, I don't know. I don't know if we want to do that unilaterally or get their buy-in for that. I think if they have any comments about that, if not, we're good with the go. Yes, I think in, I think they would agree with those terms. I think they would be comfortable with that. We can move forward with that. Move forward with that and just prove it motion. like that tonight? Yes. Okay. Then that's the motion. Be clear on the motion, three events per month. Starting at 5. five. Starting at 5 p.m. Going to 10.30. All right. And adding the um, what their fee structure into our into the contractor, just so we know. To report to us. To report to what us. What the what fees are yeah. and how much the... Uh, Cannons are the, the, and the cannons. <laughs> so that's the we are not cannons. we are not suggesting councils approving their fee structure. You just want it as a no. reference, correct? Because that's it will right. change over time. Information only. Yeah. Okay. What the fee structure is, information. I only. need to know so I can plan my party. There you go, <laughs> Councilor Lesser. Before we vote, Councilor Lesser. I just wanted to say I support the motion. I support the way uh, Councilmember Napolitano has framed it. We support the event that's coming up tomorrow. We wish we could have known about it earlier, but nonetheless, we are in support of it. Moreover. We have a partnership with OTS and the Roundhouse and what they do. They really are remarkable in how they invite the community and those from outside the community to learn about ocean life, and they are really a fixture for our peer, and they have to raise money. Um, this is an important part of their ability to be able to serve the community, be able to fundraise, but they have to have, a, there must be a balance. There must be a balance in when they do it so they do not limit the public unreasonably from enjoying the facility. So with that, I support We're going to set up item 17. Yes, way to go. Um, voting screen, please. Two. 
She faked us out on that one. <laughs> Motion passes 5-0. And Mayor, I just want to clarify. So three per month. They want anything more than three per month. They have to come back to the city council. The hours, we may have to um, confer with staff about the 5 o'clock. I'm not sure we can start that early. And we'll let you know. Why not? As noted, I agreed. Uh, we all it's, agree. It's all about access, access to the public. Coastal Commission. Yes. Oh, well, Coastal Commission, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> we can start at midnight. Yeah, okay. we'll, yeah. After they, yeah, we put an SDR out there. <laughs> all right. <laughs> access to the coast. That item is passed. Our next item. Oh, we're at item L already? Wow. City Council request reports, including AB 1234 reports. Anybody go anywhere? Nope. Not Joe. <coughs> Two. So I'll report. I had the, the uh, honor, according to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, in lovely Columbus, Ohio. OH. Those who have not been to Columbus, Ohio in June, it's a treat. <laughs> I'll tell you that. So, no, it was good. And I brought this report back. There's so much going on. I walked away with a highlight. Now, last time I was there, remember, I didn't, we didn't know, go anywhere in COVID, right? There was no mayor's conference in 2020. We we're all at home watching TV. So I think the advantage, we haven't caught up to each other in a long time. But the, the biggest thing here was the last time we were there, I think I was there, what, March of 20, Bruce? No, somewhere in there. I think it was 19, 20. I forget anymore. Anyway, I come back home. DOT, uh, the feds gave the city of Manhattan Beach $400,000 to use electric buses, uh, which is a big deal. And I think Mark, Director Lehman is searching down to a couple of bids left to go and pick our two fancy electric buses out for Dino Ride. And this year, going to DOT, they were there saying, hey, Richard, we're giving money to cities directly, not the states, not to the counties. That's a separate issue. If Manhattan Beach wants to apply to get federal funding for EV building, they give you money direct to the cities. It's a two-page form. Two pages. That's it. I can hug that lady. I, said, I love things like that. <laughs> so walking out of that, that was the number one thing I walked. There's so much going on. I don't want to tell you all of it. Uh, each city went around the room talking about what they do to handle homeless mental health. We're not alone in the mental health homeless issue, folks. It's all across the country, small cities, smaller than us, medium, all the large, all have the same issues. Just the scale is different. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing. Look at California to be their problem solver. What is California doing? What's Matt Beach doing? So I sent them all George Gabriel's blueprint, and they sent it around to each other. And Mayor Bass, she, LA Mayor Bass, uh, Karen Bass, she loves the idea. Of, what's your model? How do you do it? I pointed George and Bruce and PD and Fire and Harbor and Faith. You can make it work. At least try the models that are working and see what happens. Yes, I know people say, Richard's LA. You can't fix LA. Well, it's got to start somewhere. Why don't you use our model and see what happens? So... She, Jillian, I was impressed with her knowledge and the depth she's going to individually to walk to homeless parks with her by herself and her staff, of course. But she's walking them. So that, and it's good. It's an honor to represent our city. And they all know who we are. Yes, they all know our roundhouse. Yes, they know the aquarium. But they all know who we are. Not just sketchers. There's more to the city than that. But they all were saying how, you know, California, they love our city and want to all visit here. I said, come on down. We like sales tax revenue and TOT. But so much to talk about. There's too much time to talk about the book. I'll leave it to our city clerk to talk about, but it's an honor to go. And I know that Joe will go to Amy and David have been before. Your time's coming up, Steve. And I, well, I didn't want to go back to that stuff. Amy will represent us in the Buckeye State. I actually found out what a Buckeye was when I was there. Ain't nothing but a nut. That's a yeah, nut. we found that out. <laughs> so that's all I have to report. That's a nut. And, uh, that's a nuts and clumps. Nothing but a nut. <laughs> yeah, well, Ohio. we're good on that one. That's how we say it. Um, what else we got? What's our next item up? 17. 17. Consider a request by Mayor Montgomery and Mayor Tim Franklin to discuss the COVID-19 loan provided to the OCS Roundhouse Aquarium City Manager Mo. We are just looking for a third vote from your colleagues to bring this back at a future meeting. Sure. Mm -hmm. Councilor Howitt is your third vote. Councilor Lester is your fourth vote. Okay. I'm yeah. really fast with my reflexes with votes <laughs> and stuff like that. Can I, can I, yes. So, is this to waive it for everyone who took out a loan as well? No, specific to this one uh, borrower. Okay, thank you. And next item up, Martha. Future and items. Who's got a future and items? Yes, I have one. Anyone else before I go? I don't be the only person. Not this time. Nobody else? 
I have one agenda item to revisit based on resident concerns and social media issues that they have to review the appointment to the, uh, Bruce, what's it called? L.A. County Vector Control. Correct. Co- vector Control position. Most of you, I know some of you have received the same emails I have. Maybe I only received them. A lot of residents were concerned that our vetting process was suspect, that we showed favoritism, that we did not show that same favoritism to other uh, well uh, balanced and I would say experienced applicants. They want to see the same consideration. I can't go into merits here, discuss it, except that we need to review the appointment for the LA County Vector Control. Looking for a second to do that. And anybody understand what I'm talking about? LA County Vector Control, Joe, is the is LA County yeah. appointment. I, I didn't get any emails. I haven't gotten any emails. It'll probably come to your inbox. Councilor Franklin? I'll be, a, I'll be a second to that. We also quite, I can't go into merits. That's all I can say, right? Yeah. There's a second from Mayor Tim Franklin. That's all I need to say. Who else has got future agenda items? Can you share some of those emails, though? So yeah, I will. For when it comes uh, back. Mr. Attorney, can I share the emails so it's on the agenda, or do I go through the city manager or the clerk? No, you can share them, because any emails that went to the to the city, any individual city council member is a public record. Forward them on. Yes, all it's right. a public record. Oh, we have to rele- oh, please. You'd have to release them. Pursuant to a PRA request, anyway. Sir, Independent of each other or in mass? Individually, it's still subject to the PRA. All right, fine. Thank all, you. All your emails on city business are public. Got it. All right. Next item up City Manager Report. None tonight, thank you. Wow. Next item City Attorney Report. Nothing tonight. Let's see, informational items, who's got nothing exciting there? I'm surprised nobody else has jumped out to say something about it. All right, we will meet again on June, we'll adjourn to June 20th, 2023, Tuesday at 6 p.m. City Council meeting at Council Chambers. Thank you all. Before you adjourn, um, we're thinking, um, go ahead and adjourn to 5 o'clock on that day, uh, just in case we need a closed session. All right. You heard the city attorney. We're going to save the placeholder at 5 p.m. on June 20, 2023, Tuesday at 5 p.m. Thank you all. Have a good night. get a diagnostic test, there actually isn't a specific treatment for COVID-19, so you really might be able to ride this out at home. If you are older or have underlying illnesses, you need to contact